Hello, I'm Jacob Keeney. I'm going to be doing a video about my former employer of four years, Breeze Sue Car Wash today. I'm going to be trying to cover a lot of evidence. I'm just going to start at the end here and we'll see uh, how far back I can go. All right, let's do this. So to start at the end here, um, the last point of contact was actually a cease and desist letter from Breeze Through Car Wash after I contacted them about using my image in their advertising. So as you can see in that red circle there, that's my smiling face looking right back at you. And so I sent them a few emails telling them, of course, uh, to stop using my image in their advertising. And what did they send me back? Let's take a look. Okay, I'll just flash the whole letter real quick, and then I will read through it. So again, I catch this company using my face in their advertising. I know other people in that ad would not like to be used as well. And so I make this post, I take over the Breeze Through Car Wash subreddit, and I make this post, and then they send me this email. Or sorry, they send me this um, letter. Oh, okay, so they start off, we represent Breeze Through Car Wash. We were informed that you have engaged in a defamation and harassment campaign against Breeze Through Car Wash and its management. The company has possession of derogatory statements that you post on Reddit and derogatory emails you have sent to management. You have confirmed that you drafted and posted false and or defamation def statements on Reddit including, I am now the acting spokesperson for the company. I worked at this company for four years and they are truly the scum of the earth. Let me um, just stop there for a second because I actually did work at this company for four years and they actually truly are the scum of the earth. So I'm very confused, like can I not use my work history now? I, I don't know. Let's keep going. The company uses a variety of slave labor tactics. Yeah, that was actually my last email before I was fired. I was talking about the exploitation uh, free mandatory labor demanded by the company. Okay, going on. We have also confirmed that you drafted and sent Janice and John Agnew a harassing and threatening email entitled Hope You're Ready on August 1st, 2021. This email also contained false def defamatory harassing and threatening statements, including I now know exactly the kind of insurance fraud a breeze through is running. True uses the slave labor practices of having employees arrive early and be forced to work. True. I even believe I saw managers changing the time clock to the five minute mark. True. Now, of course, this is all going to become a little bit more relevant as I go back. Then it goes on to the I hope you enjoyed sending the employees who harassed me to lie to the unemployment office. There's a lot of dot, dot, dot. There's kind of uh, juxtaposing stuff. Did everything possible to leave me in ruin. That is true. See you in hell. Wow, they really got me here. They've got some fire here. As you know, the above statements are utterly false without merit. Untruthful speech has never been protected for its own sake by a Virginia State Board of Pharmacy versus Virginia Citizens Consumer Council. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to read the whole paragraph. Your statements are defamatory per se in that they depict our client as engaging in a legal activity that violates civil and potentially criminal law. I agree. As you know, the unemployment division in a separate government entity that evaluates Evidence independent of private employers in relation employees' claims for unemployment crimes. That, that sentence doesn't even really make sense, but whatever. The next paragraphs go on to say that I pleaded my case before the unemployment office. Not really true. The entire unemployment process was a complete sham. I'm going to go over that. Um, and it is like psychotic in nature. They are looking for anything. Like the primary reason they used against me was rudeness on the allegation I scoffed. So I'm losing unemployment benefits during the pandemic on the allegation I scoffed at somebody. But we'll, we'll go deeper, because it's much, much deeper. There is nothing inappropriate or illegal about unemployment about the unemployment division engaging in the legal function for which it was established. Further, there is nothing illegal about Breeze to Car Wash providing information related to your separation from the company for the division's consideration. These people lied back to back to back to back, very easily provable, and in almost every aspect. They were just lying and lying and lying. They lied so hard, they convinced the unemployment office I committed a job abandonment when, in fact, I went to take a single day off with 121 hours of PTO available. But after winning initially, the unemployment office would then go later back and chain it to me as having quit so they could steal my benefits. That's what this car watch is doing to people. Continue reading from the letter. Moreover, your emails to our management team are intentionally harassing and threatening and thus in violation of Colorado's criminal code. Criminal harassment is when a person with the intent to harass, annoy, or alarm another person directly or indirectly initiates communication with a person or directs language towards another person, dot, 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 by computer, dot, 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 
in a manner intended to harass. I, I have no idea if that's right. But no, actually, they were harassing me by using my image. As far as I'm aware, using someone's image in your advertising without their consent actually is illegal. So there you go. Yeah, you're the ones violating the law, bud. Furthermore, your conduct has created disruption at our workplace. Your attempts to spread false and defamatory material have caused serious and irreparable injury to its reputation. Reese 2 Car Wash will not stand by and allow this misconduct to continue. I'd like to point out that I got this letter October 14th or a little bit after that, um, 2021. I then went and started posting a lot more stuff on Breeze Through Car Wash. They didn't seem to do anything because, yeah, they're lying sacks of shit. Breeze Through Car Wash demands that you immediately cease and desist in publishing any false and defamatory statements or comments and remove from all social media websites all the defamatory and disparaging remarks regarding our client made by you. So they are trying to control my speech now. But please note that we do not attempt to restrict legitimate free speech. There's legitimate free speech, and then there's what I'm doing, illegitimate free speech, speaking out against these terrible people. Please note that we do not attempt to restrict legitimate free speech, and we believe the Internet is an important medium for dissemination of accurate and truthful information and for fair comment on issues of interest. We also do not attempt to restrict your ability to engage in protected, concerted activity. Your activities, however exceed the bounds of protected activity and unlawfully encroach on our client's rights. This letter puts you on notice that you must immediately cease all activity listed above and comply with our demands. This very serious matter requires your immediate attention. Please be advised that Breeze 2 Car Wash reserves the right to pursue appropriate legal action against you, including seeking injunctive relief. In addition, Breeze 2 Car Wash demands that you preserve all originals and electronics or hard copies of all written communications you have sent to Breeze 2 Car Wash current and former employees managers and executives this demand includes but is not limited to emails text messages and electronic transmissions all such documents may be evidence should it become necessary for breeze through car wash to pursue legal remedies against you destroying discarding or losing such documents may itself give rise to legal liability now if i lose something that's i'm not, I'm not liable for that sorry please be advised that how you proceed from this point forward will directly influence how breeze through car wash chooses to respond to behavior should you govern yourself accordingly hmm I'm sorry, that's you should govern yourself accordingly. Hmm. Okay. Let's get into it. Let's let's see why I'm so mad at these people. So that's the end. That was the last contact I had with Breeze Through Car Wash with that cease and desist letter. I then since took over again the Breeze Through Car Wash subreddit on Reddit and have been posting stuff there uh, ever since. So yeah, it's pretty much filled up with uh, hateful stuff against Breeze Through Car Wash. Feel free to check it out. Um, I'm just going to continue on down back, like what led to that letter. Now, all that threat, and they actually did send me a check. Now, I asked them to pay for using me in their advertising, but they attempted to send me my old PTO. Now, I consider that PTO as being stolen from all the employees, so I did not cash that check. I live here broke today, and it was not very big, so they can go screw themselves there. Breeze Through Car Wash likes to steal their employees' PTO by firing them and not letting them actually use it to take a day off. That's how that works, so I'm not going to take their stolen money, sorry. Okay, so I'm not going to be going into um, what led to my termination at this car wash. Um, they claim job abandonment, though, which is a form of quitting. So we'll see who's right on that. I'll let you be the judge. According to Breeze Through Car Wash and the Unemployment Office, I, I guess I'm at fault here. We'll see. Now, I wrote all this down um, shortly after, and I had um, documentation from previous years as well. So I'm going to just flash through all that real fast so you can read if you want to.
Okay, and that's the end of my primary write-up so far. Sorry if that was a little uh, convoluted there. But that story is basically what I'd be trying to cover here, so I'm going to go back to when I was fired. So this was back at the end of um, 2019, right at the start of 2020, the um, end of January. And so I was showing up to work by my phone on about eight minutes early, definitely well within company policy, everything like that. Um, I'm arriving on site by their clock right around five minutes early. There's usually no problem with that. Um, I start heading to the front door. I am very literally charged outside, not allowed to clock in, not allowed to do anything, by the assistant manager, who is now asking me about making a phone call, which is pretty much patently absurd when you consider I'm showing up early to work. Usually you make a phone call when you're showing up late. And I have never, not once in my four years of working there, made a phone call if I was going to be showing up before my scheduled time, not once. And so this is the actual attendance policy. I'm going to read it real quick. Attendance and punctuality. Attendance and punctuality are important factors for your success in our company. We work as a team, and that requires each person be in the right place at the right time. On time is being in a neat, clean, and complete Risu car wash uniform five minutes before the start of your shift. If you are going to be late for work or absent, notify the manager as far in advance as is feasible under the circumstances but before the start of your shift. Personal issues requiring time away from work, such as doctor's appointment or other matters, to be scheduled during your non-work hours possible. If you are absent for two days without notifying the company, it is assumed that you have voluntarily abandoned your position with the company and you will be removed from the payroll. Now, this is the section that was primarily used against me. I'd like to note that the company is basically trying to say I have to be there five minutes early in uniform, but it doesn't actually say I have to be on site. It doesn't say I have to be clocked in five minutes early. It doesn't say any of the stuff that will eventually be used against me. I would like to note that they say two days without notifying the company, it is assumed that you have voluntarily abandoned your position. When I was fired, I left work that day taking a single day absence. The manager acknowledged that in his statement. Now, this is a statement from the manager that fired me, uh, Von Mead. Jacob stated that this was ridiculous and that he felt he was being harassed. He said that he was going to go home for the day. He then proceeded to clock out and walked out the door. I did not give him permission to leave. I'd like to note that the company policy... So just noting this poli policy, it does not say ask permission. It says notify the manager if I'm going to be absent. I provided an audio recording that proved I notified him I was going to be absent for a day. And then uh, he, in his own statement, acknowledges he knew it was for a single day. Just note that. Because this manager would call me back in. And so this is the list. I basically showed up to work and I was read this. And so Jacob was late on his shift on 127-2020. That's a lie. Amanda attempted to coach him on the correct procedure to follow when running late. Jacob walked away from her during this feedback. That is also a lie. After hearing this from Amanda, I reviewed Jacob's pro scan and determined the best way oh, to determine the best way to communicate with him. Um, a pro scan is like a personality profile the company made me take. I attempt to coach I attempted to coach Jacob on the way he acted towards Amanda while receiving feedback. I pulled Jacob into the office and went over that he has been with the company for four years and also needs to be respectful when receiving feedback. Again, I was not disrespectful at all. I answered all of her questions and then just went to grab a radio as usual, and she stormed back outside after following me inside. That's it. Jacob then left his shift one hour into a shift without approval. Again, I did not need permission or approval after providing notification. According to the policy, Jacob is being let go for abandoning his position. Now, in the unemployment um, hearing, which I can pull up, and when I showed up to work, he did not say abandoning his position. He said job abandonment. Now, the company defined policy for abandoning his position. Okay, so abandoning, abandon your position with the company is absent for two days. So I left for one day or intendedly for one day. This manager calls me back into the office for a meeting at five o'clock the same afternoon I left and then fires me as if I had been absent for two days without contacting the company. They would then successfully use this to unemployment to convince them that I had just quit. It was completely insane when they fired me. They were using the word discharged, um, but no, no, no. It's, it's me quitting. They can just call me back in. Apparently two days can happen in a single afternoon. There you go. But I would just like to know that this company is lying about everything. They're lying about their own policies. They're lying about how they're enforcing them, and they're clearly lying about me committing job abandonment. You can't say I'm gone for one day and then pretend like it's two or three or whatever days they want to do. It's complete nonsense. But I guess if it comes to stealing um, from the unemployed, yeah, Breeze 2 Car Wash has no depths, no shame. They are lying as come. Okay, so I kind of forgot where I was. Um, so again, Amanda approaches me outside. 
She's now asking about a phone call. I just answer her politely. I'm not, I'm not rude. Like, oh, I'm never going to make a phone call. No, no, I'm like, oh, why would I call? Why would I call when I'm early? And then she's like, did you make a phone call? Yeah, and I'm just like, no, because that was the correct answer. I, I just told her, no, I didn't make a phone call. And then literally I just clocked in because I didn't feel like receiving coaching off the clock as Breeze through Car Wash Management often expects. And then I went to, again, as the company dictates, go grab a radio. Usually you clock in, grab a radio at that company. Now, I took one step out from behind the counter, hadn't gone anywhere, and then she made this big huff and ran out the door again. And then they're going to claim I walked away. So she charges up at me, and then she storms out, and then she will go on to complain to not only the manager, but apparently the regional manager, and I'm guessing even further than that, about me scoffing, but she's not ever going to mention this to me. So I'm just at work for like an hour. I think it's a little bit unusual, but again, Risu Car Wash Management is always acting weird. They are completely psychopathic, especially around this weird policy where the start of your shift is apparently five minutes early before the start of your shift, but you actually can't clock in before that point. So again, they make it five minutes early. You got to be there, but you couldn't actually clock in until that five minute mark. So you actually had to show up 10, 15, 20 minutes early and just sit around and wait. And yes, they would coach you if you attempted to clock in early. So an hour after this incident, as they would refer to it, or episode, as they would later call it for me, so me arriving at work by the end of the unemployment fiasco, they are now describing my arrival early at work as my having an episode. They would, re they would refer to it that morning as an incident, and it was just completely insane. But let's go deeper, shall we? So this was the conversation I had that morning with the manager. He called me in for this conversation, and this was one of the only times in my life I've actually had to start recording. And the only other two times I've had to start recording were with Breeze Through Car Wash Management. So I'm actually going to play this recording now, and we'll see how that goes. Now, one thing I want to state about this recording is, like, I started this after attempting to have a conversation with him just in the hallway it was just us alone in the office i was just wiping down some windows he comes up to me like oh can we have this meeting i'm like oh about what and he's like the incident with amanda he is being completely serious completely creepy and this guy who's supposed to be in uniform who's supposed to be coaching me on the policy is out of uniform so he is in that office checking my personality profile or pro scan in his pajamas completely weird but apparently i need coaching from this guy on the company policies and apparently the allegation I scoffed, which keep in mind, I hadn't heard. I also want to note that when I start this recording, I say I feel like I'm being harassed because he will not answer simple questions just about what the meeting is even about. Okay, I'm just going to try and play this recording. We'll see how that goes here. Okay, so... Yeah. This morning I show up at... 757. Uh, what time I scheduled for? Uh, I don't know. What you said at eight. Eight o'clock, right? So yeah. why, why am I getting grilled about a phone call? Because, uh, you know what time is on time? Everybody's seven minutes early. Yeah, look, listen, this isn't that big of a deal, but you don't have to take things from zero to 60 like that. All you have to so I just had to stop it there because, like, you'll notice I'm immediately at the start of this conversation being accused of taking it from zero to 60. What are they talking about? It's completely insane. I'm just going to let this whole thing play through and then I'll talk about it afterwards. Eight o'clock, right? So yeah. why, why am I getting grilled about a phone call? Because, uh, you know what time is on time? Everybody's seven minutes early. Yeah, look, listen, this isn't that big of a deal, but you don't have to take things from zero to 60 like that. All you have to do is... I'm not taking zero to 60. I didn't do anything. That's what I'm saying. But it's like, honestly, like if I'm showing up three minutes earlier than I'm scheduled, uh -huh. and getting grilled out why I didn't make a phone call, like a phone call should be more serious than showing up three minutes early before I'm scheduled. I should be getting kind of late before I'm scheduled. All right? Does that make sense? You know what the policy is, man. Yeah, the policy literally changes the definition of the English language. So I, I get it. It's five minutes early. is literally on time for you to car wash. Yeah. Um, but quite frankly, if I'm clocking in, if I'm scheduled at 8, if I clock in at 7.59, I'm expecting not to be, like, harassed about it. Well, it's being here ready to work five minutes early. You don't have to clock in five minutes early. You have to be here ready to work five minutes early. You can clock in five minutes so, early. So in three minutes, that's just too crazy. I'm going to be getting grilled about a phone call. It's, it's not about being crazy. It's about what the rules are. And it's not that big of a deal. You don't have to make it a big deal. 
Uh, I'm about to leave right now because I feel like I'm being harassed for showing up early to work. This is like this is a very unusual situation for me, except at Breezy Car Wash. You're right. I've definitely experienced this many times. You've been here four years, so you should know. And it's, I'm not harassing you. You're the one that's what's, what's the issue? What's the issue? If Amanda, I am definitely going to scoff if I'm getting asked why I'm not making a phone call for showing up to work early. Because that's the rule. You've been here four years, you should know that. No no other work environment in history expects a phone call for an employee showing up four minutes early. And I've never made phone calls if uh, I'm showing up before the scheduled time. Four years, if I've made a phone call. If I'm showing up at 8.01, I might be making a phone call. Um, but then again, I might be driving here, so it would actually be illegal to make a phone call. Like, should I be making a phone call while I'm driving? You need to pull over. So, yeah, so I should make a phone call while I'm driving. What? I'm, I'm heading into work. Pull over and actually. I might be showing up four minutes early. Uh, I should make a phone call on this. If that's a big deal for you, is make a phone call while you're driving, you can pull over. That's, that's not always reasonable. There's not always a place to pull over. And, like, I could be in a situation where I'm being blocked by a train the or something. The point is you don't have to scoff at Amanda when she's being a manager and saying, hey, why didn't you call? You know, she, just... she could be a manager, but it's like, this is this is what I'm saying. Like, so I'm not having a conversation with an assistant manager and a manager about me being three minutes early. It was the way that you reacted to Couple that. Couple managers. I, was I had honest. almost no reaction to it. All I said was, like, I'm on time. So I don't know she said, but well, you weren't on time. That's the point. It's the way that you reacted to the situation. Oh, so I'm talking, I'm talking at 7.57, um, scheduled at 8. So I'm being counted as late before I'm even scheduled. Because he, the policy no is right five minutes before. early. Late. No right for it. That's the right, And well, you know that policy. I'm not talking to you because you were late. I'm talking to you because of the way that you reacted. I, I reacted honestly you did not react. I All I said was, like, I'm pretty much on time. That's not correct, though. That's disrespectful to her. No, that's not disrespectful. I think it's very disrespectful for me being counted as late when I'm clocking in before. You know what the policy is. Oh, and charged outside. I, I'm aware of the policy, and, and I use that window as, like, the typical five-minute grace period. Typically, in a work environment, if I clocked in at 8.05, I would expect not to hear about it. It's not a grace period. There, I, I'm fully aware there's no, no grace period for you to go to wash. Yeah, yeah. So why are you acting like that when you're late? If you're aware that there's no grace period, five minutes early is five minutes early better to work. And then the cut, uh, uh, I've talked in, to you, in I've the talked in to the path, yeah, you so, definitely got on me. I, I believe me. I'm I'm aware. Yeah, and, and when you when I talk to you, about it, you're like, okay, I'll I'll call next time. And if I'm actually late, like if I showed up at eight oh one, I was getting asked why didn't I make a phone call. I'd I'd say sorry. I'll try better next time. Yeah, that's what you should say. Is, I'm sorry. I'll try better next time. If I'm showing up three minutes early before I'm scheduled, I'm not going to be making a phone call. But that's all there is to it. The policy is five minutes early. Later. Well, I, unfortunately, so, that's, that's so not a reasonable minute, policy. Late, two minutes later, there's not. There's that's not a reasonable policy because I can leave. Right there's a variance in drive time uh, to a point where I can leave, believe I'll be on time. There might be one minute extra maybe you should in leave drive early. time. Maybe you should leave early. Maybe you should that's one thing to say. I'm, I'm leaving for the day. Honestly, I have to harass. Okay, day, get harassed? I'll tell you, man. This is just crazy. I made my own own documentation of this. So here we go. Here we go again. Own own documentation of this. So here we go. Here we go. Why didn't I make a phone call? I'd, I'd say sorry. I'll try better next time. Yeah, that's what you should say. Is, I'm sorry. I'll try better next time. If I'm showing up three minutes early before I'm scheduled, I'm not going to be making a phone call. But that's all there is to it. Policy is five minutes early. Well, I, unfortunately, so, so that's not a reasonable minute, policy. Late, two minutes late, there's two minutes not. There's late. that's not a reasonable policy because I can leave. Right? There's a variance in drive time uh, to a point where I can leave, believe I'll be on time. There might be one minute extra maybe you should in leave drive time. Maybe you should leave maybe you should I, that's one thing to say. I'm, I'm leaving for the day. Honestly, I feel harassed. I'll tell you, man. This is just crazy. So just note there, I say I'm leaving for the day. Honestly, I feel harassed. And he says, all right. So he does say all right. That's usually a word for permission, but let's just look at these policies. He's claiming I'm violating again. So number one, this is the no harassment policy. I would just like to point out that on here, it actually states you should report any action that you believe may violate our policy, no matter how slight the actions may seem. Like maybe like the manager being out of uniform. Um, but also it says that things are going to be taken very serious and that there's going to be an investigation. You will not be penalized or retaliated against for reporting improper conduct, harassment, or discrimination.
Wow, so benevolent of them. Now, this is, in fact, a complete lie, and they use this to basically get you to report someone, and then they fire you for it. But again, he's saying I should have already made a phone call. So if you are going to be late for work or absent, notify managers as far in advance as feasible under circumstances, but before the start of your shift. So before the start of my shift. So in uniform, five minutes before the start of your shift. So I have to make a phone call before the start of my shift. The start of my shift is after this five minutes before part. That's my schedule time. So when I showed up that morning, I still would have had time to not clock in, set my stuff away as I usually do, and even make a phone call before the start of my shift. So how could I possibly be late that morning? Hmm, only if they're enforcing this policy in a completely illegal manner, which required me to show up early and work unpaid hours. That's how that was working. So they are completely wrong there. I, I literally could have made a phone call as Amanda was standing in the office, and it would have been before the start of my shift. So they're completely wrong here. And again, with this no harassment policy, no one would ask me the entire time, not from the unemployment office, not when I called OSHA, why did I feel harassed? No one cared why I felt harassed. These policies are completely unenforced. This is Amanda's statement. I'm just going to read that for you real fast. On the morning of January 27th, 2020, Jacob Keeney walked into work at 7.58 when he was supposed to be here at 7.55. I asked Jacob if he had called the store because I was outside finishing up uh, some opening procedures. He replied, why would I call? I replied to that with, because you are late, Jacob. He scoffed at that remark, and then we both walked away from each other. Well, what's funny is, again, she was the one who walked up towards me. She was the one who walked away. And in fact, any normal conversation that ends, ends with the people walking away from each other. There's no actual offense there. But uh, they would also fabricate this. One thing you'll notice in the original recording there. Um, I was never accused of walking away from anyone. They would tack that on, probably because it helped them steal unemployment money from me. Okay, so this is my initial claim to unemployment, um, which I won, so I'll go over that. Okay, so here we go. Um, email sent to the claimant requesting additional information. Please provide a response to all the following. The employer has provided the following statements regarding the separation. Jacob stated that he told Vaughn he was leaving early for the day and emailed management. Jacob stated to Vaughn during their conversation about his behavior towards Amanda that this was ridiculous and he felt harassed, and then he said he was going home for the day. Vaughn did not respond. So they're saying Vaughn didn't respond. I have him on recording saying, all right. Now, my side of the story is that I stopped the recording as I was standing up and, in fact, notified Vaughn very formally, letting him know I was only going to be gone for a day and the entire job site, as I did every day. But, okay, Vaughn did not respond. He clocked out and left without Vaughn's permission. Didn't need it. Therefore, abandoning his shift. Well, abandoning is a pretty strong word. Like, is taking a day off just abandonment now? I did have 121 hours of PTO. Okay, so I'm just going to read through this. Vaughn Mead and Amanda Miller are his management. He emailed Janice Agnew, VP of Admin, and Simone Tilly, regional, and Simone Tilly, regional manager, neither of which were Jacob Keeney's manager. If Jacob Keeney was feeling harassed and needed to speak to someone above Vaughn, Policy is that he would need to contact Justin Salisbury, COO, or John Agnew, president. He did not contact either of them. If applicable, please provide a response or rebuttal to this information. Okay, and it goes to, is the employer correct in stating on your last day you walked off your shift without receiving approval to leave? If not, please provide your rebuttal to the employer's information. If so, why did you obtain this approval prior to leaving? Or how would obtaining this approval have impacted you? Email response received from the claimant. Hey there, Joe. Thank you for getting back to me. I will gladly address Breeze Drew's response and can provide some documentation to verify my answers as needed. The employer has provided the follow, following statements regarding the separation. Jacob stated that he told Vaughn he was leaving early for the day and emailed management. Jacob stated to Vaughn during their conversation about his behavior towards Amanda that this was ridiculous and he felt harassed. And then he said he was going home for the day. Vaughn did not respond. He clocked out and left without Vaughn's permission, therefore abandoning his ship. I raised my concerns with Vaughn that morning about harassment and was entirely ignored as was my side of the story when he approached me about an apparent issue Amanda had. I told Vaughn I was leaving for the day, and he replied with, All right. I have an audio recording up until that point. After I stopped recording, the conversation continued. Vaughn asked me, If you don't like the policy, why am I still working here? I told him I have no issues with the job, but I feel I need the day off. He again stated it was fine for me to leave. He literally told me it was fine twice, and I made absolutely certain before I left that he understood it was just one day. And I'm going to say I actually probably did receive approval. I don't have a recording of that. I'm going to say, like, patently, I left. I felt like there was actually no issue with me leaving. I had no issue with the job, but I didn't feel any day off. You can say it's fine for me to leave. 
Bond stating he did not respond is a complete falsehood. Bond's reply just made it permissible for me to leave. Drew, even though I didn't need his permission, I just needed to provide notification according to the policy. Okay, and here's the next page here. Just going to go through this. Vaughn Mead and Amanda Miller are his management. He emailed Jimmy Sagney, Vice P VP of Admin, and Spoon Tilly, regional manager, neither of which were Dave Keeney's manager. They both were actually my management. I don't know if it's like regional manager. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely my regional manager. So just again, like the amount of lies they have in here that are just even provable within their own story is like completely absurd. Um, Okay, neither were Jacob Keeney. If Jacob Keeney was feeling harassed and needed to speak to someone above on, policy is that he would need to contact Justin Salisbury's CEO, CEO, or John Agnew President. He did not contact either of them. They are claiming I did not contact Justin Salisbury. So this is my response to that. They claim I did not contact Justin Salisbury. This is a blatant lie. So I did send that same email I sent to them with regards to harassment. I'll, I'll cover what I said in that here in a moment. This is a... So they are claiming I did not contact Justin Salisbury. The next point on the no harassment policy. This is a blatant lie. Wow, the email I had sent to Simone and Janice was forwarded to Justin the same day I was terminated. Now, I went in for a meeting, and the first part of that policy says, like, I need to first bring it to the manager, wait for their response before escalating, right? So I say I'm feeling harassed to the manager. He fires me. Well, that's retaliation. And so then I go to Justin, and all he sends back is an email, like, oh, Vaughn told me what happened. See you later, man. And then I was like, so there's going to be no reply to my concerns about harassment? Complete silence. That's how this went down. Okay, sorry for ranting there. The email I sent to Simone and Jesus was forwarded to Justin the same day I was terminated. All of them ignored my concerns entirely. I received no response, including questions specifically intended for Simone and Janice. I had spoken with Selena, the other manager, raising my concerns about harassment on 122-27. If I had been mistaken in my contacts, Janice, Simone, or Vaughn should have been able to direct me to the appropriate person. There may have been confusion on my end as I've never received a copy of the employee handbook. The entire four years I worked there, I'm going to say that no employee on the site that I was aware of actually got a copy of this employee handbook. I was made twice to sign a statement saying I received one. Each time I was like, oh, are they coming in? Can I just get one later? And they're like, yeah. But they had no problem lying to their employees. Never received a copy of the employee For over two years, Denise was a point of contact. Employees felt harassed and I received coaching and such. At one point, Scott Kaye became short of the HR department, briefly took over the role. After that, Breeze Drew failed to provide me with any updated reference to or adequate coaching. They also failed to redirect me or my concerns to the appropriate parties. But that's actually relevant because I contacted the manager and then the next up above, Justin Salisbury, who was the um, CEO. I forget exactly what that was. I think CEO was his company operations um, manager. But regardless, I, I made the appropriate contacts and, yeah, just got no response. Now, in another in another audio recording I have, which I can prove, I had raised safety, I had raised safety concerns previously and was told by Justin Salisbury to always start at the lowest level of management possible, right? So they coach you in a way that makes it much, much easier to fire you, right? You've got to start at the bottom, then they fire you before you can make the appropriate contacts. They're all set. So lowest level of management possible for your contact management. In a conversation I had with Simone and Vaughn um, on 1124 Dash 19, I was told I could contact Simone if I was having issues with Vaughn. Now, I have that on audio recording. Um, in a conversation, so, sorry. I have an audio recording as such. Simone is Vaughn's immediate supervisor. In the email, I raised specific concerns that I felt harassed by her and, and issues involving employees being forced to work mandatory unpaid time. Oh, so I was, raising, I was actually raising concerns that they were violating the law and I was fired. Hmm, that's a familiar story. If Simone and Janice felt incapable of addressing my concerns, it should have been a simple matter, or matter of involving the right people. So I did raise my concerns with Selena, Vaughn, Simone, Janice, and Justin. In each instance, I was ignored entirely, or no action was taken on the part of management to address them. Instead, they presumably coordinated my termination, which I believe to be retaliatory in nature. Still do. Is the employer correct in stating on your last day you walked off the shift without receiving approval to leave? If not, please provide your rebuttal to the employer's information. If so, why did you obtain this approval prior to leaving, or how would obtaining this approval have impacted you? I did receive approval from Bond for leaving. The approval process was identical to if I had called in sick. I stated I was leaving for the day, and Vaughn replied with, All right. That's true. You just heard the auto recording. Feel free to check that for yourself. I said again I felt the need to leave for the day, and Vaughn reiterated that it was okay before I clocked out. That's completely true. Vaughn then called me the same day at 2.11, so... 
Far from abandoning the job, I'm answering management's phone calls and returning to work at their request for a work-related meeting. <sighs> for a day, um, all right, I said I felt the need to leave for the day, and Vaughn reiterated it's okay for a clock out, then Vaughn called me the same day to 11 p.m. Um, on 127.20, and I answered. Vaughn then specifically requests I return to work for a meeting that same day at 5 p.m. Please note, Vaughn called me, I responded, Vaughn requests I return to work, and I did return to work. This should dispel any notion of job abandonment or abandonment of position. I believe they wanted to fire me as quickly as possible to avoid answering my questions in the email. Those questions were never answered. By obtaining Vaughn's approval to leave that morning, it would have been understood I was leaving only for the day and should have had little to no impact. I would note that I had over 110 hours of PTO, which they did not pay out at termination. This should have been available for my use in any extraneous situation, including a mental health day. Wow, that's pretty typical. Excuse me, I'll find probably any further information or documentation that would be of assistance, JP. Okay, so here is the original deputy. The claimant was discharged by this employer. The deputy is persuaded the direct and proximate cause of the separation occurred when the claimant allegedly walked off a shift without receiving approval. The deputy has reviewed the information presented by the claimant and the employer. Ultimately, the deputy is persuaded from the claimant's information that he reasonably believed he was presented with approval prior to leaving. The deputy is not persuaded the presented information supports the disqualification of benefits. Therefore, the deputy determines the claimant is not at fault for a separation and benefits are awarded. Well, if they fire me after they call me back in and I would have returned to work the next day, that's them firing me. Now, they can do that for any reason, but for some reason they chose abandonment of position and job abandonment. Hmm, very strange, considering I was showing up twice in the same day, not, not showing up for two days. So I'm actually just going to read that email I sent to them. I sent this to them an hour after I had left work that day, and I had already had some of this email written because I had basically been harassed by Simone Tilly just a few days prior because I did not attend the full five-hour unpaid, uh, seemingly, as she would describe it that morning, mandatory unpaid employee appreciation dinner. So about a month after this dinner, a little less than a month, um, she is now cornering me in an office. I was not really prepared for this. And then asking me about this dinner. And at first I thought she was joking because I had attended for like three hours. I have a selfie with myself and the owners to prove it. I went up on stage and grabbed my bonus check or whatever. Um, so I was there for like, yeah, three hours or so. And I was like, I thought she must've just thought I wasn't there at all after I said I would be. But no, she just started railing me and there's no real way to overcome like actually going to an event, but then I didn't work all five unpaid hours, so I guess that's also a crime. And at that time she would describe it as mandatory. The entire event was completely mandatory, so an entirely unpaid mandatory event. And at that point I started feeling like I was being harassed, and so I wrote up an email, no intention of sending it, but then a couple days later when I showed back up to work after my weekend, they were still right on it. They were still coming at me pretty hard. Okay, so this is the email I sent to them. And throughout this entire process, I would not get a single question asked about this or a single um, concern of mine answered. So I'll just read it. Okay. So, hey, Simone, I just wanted to send you an email about a conversation we had regarding the employee appreciation dinner. At the time I had felt harassed, I may have been taken aback by the line of questioning intended to make me understand the costs of the evening and correct a perceived failing in my etiquette. I was curious why this was happening three weeks after the event. I also believe you may have had misconceptions about the employee appreciation center being mandatory. You stated it was similar to a monthly safety meeting and mandatory for employees to attend. Just to clarify, was the employee appreciation dinner completely mandatory? Were employees paid for the time spent at the event? To reiterate what I told you during the conversation, I did attend the employee appreciation dinner for over two hours, wearing a suit and tie, dressed up as nicely as possible, out of uniform as requested. Because if it's a mandatory event, well, they need to pay for all the stuff including my suit, I guess, to wear there for their fancy dinner. I did have some broader concerns stemming from that conversation in a previous one. Back on November 23rd, I had a meeting with yourself and Vaughn due to issues I was having with the way my advanced training was being handled. I was getting threatened with disciplinary actions for training I had already completed in the past. I also raised the issue of Vaughn suggesting it was appropriate for employees to be expected to do training during their lunches and breaks. I thought you might correct Vaughn here, but you were silent for most of the meeting. Do you or Vaughn believe employees should be expected to do training during their breaks, lunches, or study during their off hours? This is only one aspect of the way training is currently being handled that got me riled up enough to state I would seek legal advice if necessary. That turns out to be a little bit more complicated to seek unemployment uh, legal advice during the pandemic than I, than I would have ex expected, and it's a lot less helpful in the system than people would imagine. But 
and I, I honestly did. I tried to send complaints everywhere. Sorry, let me just get back here. Seek legal advice necessary. I was threatened with termination by Vaughn for doing so. With you present, something I found questionable to say at the least, particularly when Vaughn may be the one testing legal boundaries. So I say I may seek legal action because this company is completely insane. At one point in time, I was just about to complete the advanced training. It took about two years or so. I was literally one module away, which was loading cars, like it was mastering loading, something I did every single day. Um, I would go on to complete that. So I completed the entire training course they had presented. They would then restart me entirely, denying me like a dollar raise. Um, and in theory, it was an entire company restart. But this manager, Mr. Mead here, actually skipped all of the retraining. He never got any retraining because he already had the raise and then he went up to be a manager. Oh, so I guess you can just skip it if you become a manager. I wish I would have known. So continuing on with my email. A clear example I would use at the end of the September monthly safety meeting, Vaughn attempted to make Halloween costumes mandatory. So again, he is dictating employees are going to have to buy costumes. I attempt to correct him there on the spot, saying like if you're mandating people buy costumes, freeze through car wash or even wear costumes, the car wash is going to have to cover that cost. Um, but no, I couldn't get a response that day. He just looked like I had challenged his authority or something. He's making Halloween costumes mandatory. He's the boss, man. I immediately knew this was incorrect and tried to correct the issue. I was met with complete silence when I asked multiple questions, but I could tell I had got Ron thinking at least. He was willing to consider that maybe he'd be wrong. He won't, he won't just say no mandatory Halloween costumes, but maybe he'll think about it. I've learned not to push back too hard as often it results in my employment being threatened. Drew. In that instance, management waited until the next monthly meeting to revise themselves. So one month of mandatory Halloween costumes. And then on in October, they correct themselves. Hmm. So one month, employees, in that month, employees could have brought, bought work-appropriate costumes, thinking it was required, or experienced discrimination if they did not celebrate Halloween. Oh, interesting. I use this only as an example where management is making decisions well outside of policy and ignore me when I attempt to correct them. But management at Brewster Car Wash was actually... Never wrong. I never once experienced a manager being wrong. It was always the underling employees like myself. On the issue of continuing harassment, this morning Amanda started questioning about whether or not I had made a phone call for being late to work. Late's in quotations. I'd walked in the door at 7.57 a.m. and clocked in. My shift was scheduled at 8 a.m. I do try to call in if I am late. I do not find it reasonable for me to be questioned for tardiness when I clock in before I'm scheduled to work. Vaughn later approached me about the issue of me being late, and I was told I had scoffed at Amanda when she questioned me. I had simply looked at the clock and told her politely, I am on time, during the conversation. Vaughn went as far as to question why I was working with Bruce through Car Wash. Do I really need to be getting grilled by multiple managers for only clocking in three minutes before my shift? I'm planning on reviewing any relevant labor laws and regarding these issues. I'll go to the state's labor department if needed. Well, I did go to the labor department, and basically what they said is like, oh, yeah, man, just track every minute they're making you work and we'll pay you for that. They won't actually make the company change a single policy. They won't actually make the company do something. But, hey, you might be able to get 50 cents or something if the company is making you show five minutes earlier a buck or something. That's cool. Thanks so much for the help, uh, Labor Department. Okay, that's the email I sent them. Um, very clearly saying I felt harassed. And very clearly ex explaining concerns, including legal concerns, with very clear examples like, oh, hey, this guy's making Halloween costumes mandatory. Like, if I went and bought a $10,000 Halloween costume and tried to charge the company during that time, I probably could have, but, oh, I'd probably need a lawyer to make it happen, so good luck. And again, this is like the tip of the iceberg. I'm just going to keep right on going down through this nonsense. And we're just going to go back even further here. Or I'm actually going to continue with the unemployment process. So we just went over the first section where I won. Um, and I was now able to collect unemployment benefits. I was actually surprised I had to go through that process. I was surprised the former employer was so involved. So they fire me, and then they get to also determine my unemployment benefits. That's, um, that's generous of this system. Okay, so now the company would appeal. I'm going to go over that process here now. Okay, so it's fact-finding supplement. Um, I'm not sure if this was part of the first one or the second one. I think it might have been the first one, but I'll just read through this real quick. Okay, please write a response to all the following. Um, email sent to the employer requesting additional information. The claim has provided the following statements regarding the separation. As I was walking up to the building, Amanda, assistant manager, came up from the parking lot asking me twice, did you call Kitty? I could see the clock on the wall that showed me arriving a few minutes early. I answered back with a slightly confused no. 
I then entered the building and clocked in before my scheduled time. Amanda followed me inside, repeating the same question twice. Did you call, Katie? I answered both times with, I'm pretty much on time. There was a moment of silence, and I moved out from behind the counter and walked towards the office. Amanda walked back outside, making an odd noise. I had several other interactions with her, and she raised no concerns to me. A short time later, Vaughn called me into the office, and I had a conversation with him. Vaughn said I had scoffed at Amanda and overreacted. I began feeling harassed because I had clocked in early. I told Vaughn I was leaving for the day, and I sent an email to management. I had 110 hours of PTO. I believe Vaughn was looking for any small reason to fire me. Starting when he became assistant manager, he became condescending towards me. This continued until I was terminated, despite my best efforts to be an ideal employee. I had raised concerns recently and years prior that I believe led to my termination. Breeze, who has a five minutes early is on time policy, I'd like to note that I did not have the um, actual employee handbook in front of me, which made it very difficult to argue the specific policies initially. They would then send the policies on their appeal, and they would prove me right in every instance. Five minutes early is on time policy. Now, this does require me to arrive much earlier, typically 10 to 20 minutes, and wait or risk being late. I clocked in at 7.57 a.m., scheduled at 8 a.m. I'm not allowed to clock in prior to the five minutes before my shift. Amanda asked me four times in a row, did you call Keeney? I did answer her questions each time with slight confusion. Amanda was the one who walked out of the building in a huff and made the situation dramatic. I learned from Vaughn that Amanda had been expecting an apology. I am not sorry when clocking in early. Vaughn would not listen to my side of the story. Uh, and then it goes, if act will please provide a response for this information. Is the claimant correct in stating on 127.20 he arrived at 7.50 a.m. for a shift that began at 8 a.m.? Mm, yep. If not, please provide your rebuttal to the claimant's information. If so, why is the claimant considered to be late when arriving prior to the start of the shift? In your initial response to the division's request for information, it was indicated that the claimant walked away from Amanda when she attempted to coach him. Please provide any details of this interaction, including specifics of what was discussed, as well as what Amanda said to the claimant just before he walked away. So, again, she says we walked away from each other. Now it's just me walking away. Even though she creates the interaction, <clears throat> she claims I scoffed. And she gets to get away with all this stuff. But I guess she probably never heard no in her life. So she asked for me a phone call. I said no. Probably shocked her senses. Okay, the next page. I'll just read this real quick. So it goes, if available, please provide a written statement from Amanda regarding this incident to be added to the claim record. Now that's the one I just went over earlier where she claims we both walked away from each other. I should have been there at 7.55, um, except I still had time to make a phone call um, according to their own policy. And the policy actually didn't define late. It defined the word on time. Um, you're late. The word late should actually be very, very clearly defined. And of course, this is just their own um, own evidence. They've read. It wasn't meant by on time. Five minutes early. You'll notice that does not define late. In your initial response to the division's request for information, it was indicated after interaction with the man that the claimant was spoken to again and again walked away. Please provide any available details of this interaction including around what time this took place, who spoke with the claimant at the time, specifics of what was discussed, and details of what was said to the claimant just before he walked away. Is the claimant correct in stating on 12720 he had 110 hours of PTO to use? If not, please provide your rebuttal. Is the claimant correct in stating he provided notes to Vaughn and sent an email to Mandra if I noticed that he was leaving for the day? If not, please provide your rebuttal to the claimant's information. Number one, Jacob did not clock in on time in accordance with our company policy in the employee handbook. My clock in time would have been identical to any other day. That at five minutes early and in that window was the only time they let you clock in. Again, I have them on audio recording saying there's no grace period. So five minutes early, it's late, and there's no grace period. They will not let you clock in before that point. So everyone's just showing up 10, 20, 15 minutes early or being harassed by management for literally nothing. And it was completely illegal. Many, many employees raised the concerns it was illegal. But again, no one in the system actually enforces those laws. Whereas the poor of us, the working class, of course, have this insane one minute late, goodbye to your unemployment policy, goodbye to your unemployment benefits. Okay, did not, clock in, did not clock in on time accordance in accordance with our company policy and the employee handbook. Our attendance policy states on time as being in a neat, clean, and complete breeze cross uniform five minutes before the start of your shift. We do not have a policy stating that he was not allowed to clock in earlier than five minutes. Um, they enforced it that way. He did not clock in earlier than five... Oh, wait, he did clock in earlier than five minutes on several occasions without being questioned by managers. This manager who's writing this, I literally had no interaction with. She was not in the building with me ever, and that is a complete lie. The few times out of the four years, which would be about a thousand clock-in times, 
I clocked in because customers were in there waiting, and they started bothering me right as I walked in the door. So I'd clock in early, and then management would literally come and coach me, and I would not be shocked if they even changed the time clock to get rid of those couple minutes. They were completely insane. I don't know about them changing the time clocks, but they would definitely coach you about it. Okay, we do have a receipt of employee handbook. This is true. They made me sign it under the pretense they would actually get me one later. The first time, it seemed like no big deal, just filling out a bunch of documents when I'm getting employed. The second time, they made some change to the employee handbook. They gave me like a page or two, a new no-harassment policy. Made me sign another waiver saying I got one. I actually knew the employee handbook quite well. I wasn't too concerned about it, but ah, when I have to argue later to the unemployment office, it did become much more difficult to argue policy. I will admit that. So they have the receipt, but that's actually no, I'm the one who signed that, and I'm the one saying, yeah, that signature, not valid, because I was never actually given an employee handbook. It was kind of a false pretense. And employee at will statement that Jacob signed, stating that he read and the policies, uh, signed and dated, 3, 4, 17. I also have a copy of this basic manual that that is proof he knows the policy dated, whatever. Jacob stated that he told Yvonne he was leaving early for the day and emailed management. Jacob stated to Vaughn during conversation about his behavior towards Amanda that this was ridiculous and he felt harassed. And then he said he was going home for the day. Vaughn did not respond. So again, they say Vaughn did not respond. Complete falsehood. If my recording went for like another minute or two, it would be very, very easy to disprove. I was glad to have that single all right, to be, to be frank. But I would have preferred another couple of minutes. Don't turn off your recording early. That's what, uh, that's what I'd say. Um, okay, Vaughn did not respond. He clocked out and left without Vaughn's permission. I provided a notification and got permission, therefore abandoning his shift. So left without Vaughn's permission, therefore abandoning his shift. Vaughn, me, and Amanda Miller are his management. He emailed Janice Agnew, vice president of administration, and Simone Tilly, regional manager, neither of which were Jacob Keeney's manager. So the regional manager is not one of my managers. That's weird. If Jacob Keeney and the vice president of administration, that's not a part of management i i'm actually confused by that if jacob Keeney was feeling harassed and needed to speak to someone above vaughn the policy is that he would need to contact justin salisbury coo or john agnew president he did not contact either of them again i did contact justin i did contact justin jacob was not correct in stating that he arrived at 7 57 a.m he clocked in at 7 58 a.m doesn't change anything he was considered late because he did not meet the attendance policy They've never written me up for being late except when I arrived beyond the scheduled time. Not that they weren't acting insane, but they had never actually done a formal write-up. And what I would basically tell them every time is like, shove off, what you're doing is illegal. So would all the other employees. Please see attached statement from Amanda, attached statement from Vaughn. Yes, Jacob Keeney had 110 hours PTO when he abandoned his shift. Um, again, abandoning a shift or abandoning your job? Like, I don't think you abandon a shift, you just take a shift off. It's not abandonment. Without permission, again, have them saying, all right. Jacob also knows the PTO policy from the employee handbook states upon discharge, employers are not paid for unused PTO. The state law dictates otherwise. Well, you know, I'm going to go cover that policy real quick because actually what I was referring to with the PTO policy was that it actually had unstipulated, unscheduled use. So here is that PTO policy. And you can see, ah, okay, so they discharged me to steal my PTO, right? So they got actually got 121 hours of PTO. It's about 2000 bucks. That's nice for them. But ah, watch this. In order to use unscheduled PTO, the employee must have a request submitted to management no later than the last day of the pay period of which the unscheduled PTO falls, falls in. So if I'm using scheduled PTO, it's like, yeah, two weeks, but unscheduled PTO, no stipulations on its use, just have a request submitted. And again, I do not need PTO in particular to take a day off. This is my absentee record. Um, probably too blurry to read, but I'll read some for you. Keeney helped out by covering somebody's shift. Thank you. Oh, other employees seem to be able to take a day out. Jacob switched out his shift to help out the closers because a CSA called off sick and we needed help closing. Thank you for all that you do. Keeney called off sick. This AM. Something I can't read. Wow, so other employees seem to be able to take a day off. I seem to be able to just call off sick. I don't know, seem weird. Seem to be able to take days off previously. Hmm. Okay, I kind of forget where I left off here. Um, so... At Will statement that he had read and understood the pay time off policy in the employee handbook. Jacob said that he told Vaughn he was leaving early for the day and emailed management. Jacob walked out early from a shift, therefore abandoning it. Vaughn Mead and Amanda Miller are his management. He emailed Janice, VP of admin, and Simone Tilly, regional manager, neither of which were Jacob Keyes' manager. Like, again, they just keep repeating these same arguments over and over. And I don't know if you can understand that, like, the managers above me actually are my managers. It's kind of crazy. 
um, and I actually contacted all of the managers that morning, so I'm, I'm still not sure what they're talking about. Okay, please see attached files and supporting documents from Vaughn and Amanda. Thanks. One second, I'll flip the page. Okay, I'll just read this one as well. Um, email, response from the employer. You can go 14 attachments. Here are the answers to it. The additional questions you left me via voicemail. I've also attached the documents you requested me to resend. I don't know why Jacob Keeney didn't follow the harassment policy. So they're saying I didn't follow the harassment policy, even though I did. I again contacted the manager, waited for his response. After I was terminated out of retaliation, I then contacted the next one up. That would have been following policy. At that point in time, I was already terminated. That's why I didn't go straight to the president, because I was not expecting much help from that company. If the manager ignored me, the COO ignored me, Wow, they were all ignoring me. And in fact, the vice president of administration also ignored my email completely, as did the regional manager. Wow, no response from any of them. But I'm the one not following this, even though they're the one obligated to give an investigation. And in fact, at some point in time, they would say Justin Salisbury conducted an investigation, but he did so apparently without asking me any questions and actually not responding to my last email when I specifically said, so there will be no... Um, no address to my concerns about harassment or something similar. Didn't follow the harassment policy. Attached, you will find the harassment policy in the employee's handbook. The first point of contact would be the site manager, Vaughn Mead. Yep, okay. Did that, if you can resolve the issue with Vaughn, next contact would have been the regional operations manager, Justin Salisbury, did that. And he would still be the person in contact in the harassment issues. Then President John Agnew. Jacob was aware of this policy and he signed the employee handbook and that rule statement signed 3216. So again, I did contact Justin Salisbury, and I did not contact the president after I was already terminated. Now, the email was not forwarded to Justin Salisbury or Justin Agnew. So they specifically say no, the email was not forwarded to Justin Salisbury or John Agnew. I definitely forwarded this, and I definitely got a single reply saying, basically, Vaughn told me what happened. Goodbye. Let me see if I can actually find that. There you go. The original 127.20, 525. Yeah, I'm right there at the bottom. Vaughn just fired me. Oh, not me abandoning, him firing me. And there you go. So there will be no reply to my concerns about harassment. Completely silent after that from Justin Salisbury. So I did follow the harassment policy. I was only required to, I was only required to make two points of contact to receive an investigation. If he investigated, he did so without asking me a single question or replying. Hmm, very interesting. Okay, so they would now appeal this decision, and suddenly their answers would change from re me receiving no response, so Jacob was trained and coached on company policy. Yeah, I actually understood that they didn't. Jacob was not being harassed. He was being managed. Um, there was a concerted effort to communicate with Jacob before he walked off. Jacob abandoned his position. Well, abandoned his position would imply that he didn't show up or make contact for two days. Um, so they either have no response. That didn't seem to work for him. No response didn't seem to work for him. So now there was a concerted effort to communicate with Jacob before he walked off. Now, they didn't um, actually respond to my email. And again, I didn't walk off, as they say. I left after providing notification, which followed the policy, and um, speaking with the manager, making it very clear. And I'm going to say received his approval. That is what I honestly say. I do genuinely believe that because he told me all right twice. Okay, this a little bit out of order. I'm just going to read through some of the original, original arguments I made. So he had checked my personality profile on before having a conversation in the morning. I'd walked out of him. He was terminating me for job abandonment. I would get my deposit back when I returned my uniform. I told him I would get back to him and left. So he fires me and I just leave the job and I'm told to bring my uniforms back. So I've apparently committed job abandonment um, except I'm showing up to work twice in the same day and being asked to return my uniforms as I'm being fired. Um, abandonment is actually a form of quitting, by the way, not being fired. Um, what was the last thing that happened that caused the employer to fire you? As I was walking up to the building, Amanda, assistant manager, came up to me in the parking lot asking me twice, did you call Kenny? I could see a clock on the wall. Okay, I think I actually covered most of the stuff in the other ones. Um, yeah, so actually I read through all that, so I'm just going to leave that there. This was the initial claim that I won. I'm going to get on to the appeal of theirs and how I ended up losing. So this was a brief write-up um, I supplied to the um, hearing officer and the car wash before the hearing. And not a single one of these questions or concerns of mine would actually be answered, but I'm going to get to that. 
I kind of forget exactly what this is in reference to, but okay, so number one, two, the, the deputy specifically asked for the policy that finds time late. You know, let me see if there's another page this one second. Okay, sorry about that. Here's the first page. I'm just going to read through this. Okay, unemployment um, insurance appeal hearing. I'd like to submit a written statement and provide documentation for the scheduled phone hearing on 4 4 also, I will include audio recordings from 1 and 11 19 that I referenced in the case. My absentee record for the year of 2019 up until 11 19 The company uniform policy and the email I sent to Justin, Simone, and Janice. If possible, I would like a screenshot or the video from when Vaughn and I were speaking that morning on 1 20 If possible, I would like to be provided with a recording of the proceedings. I would get the recording of the proceedings. I would not actually get a video that would show that, oh, the managers are actually approaching me outside the building to coach me about being early or late or whatever, and they're coaching me on the same policy and scoffing while they're not following the policies themselves. Pretty bad. So I am very concerned with the way Vaughn and Simone have presented this case to the deputy. At this hearing, I would like to prove that they have made and signed false statements and been entirely untruthful, both by mission and direct lies. Since Simone has provided me with all of the policy they allege I violated, violated, I can now prove I followed company policy to the letter in every instance, and clearly demonstrate that they have knowingly tried to deceive the deputy on what the company policies were. Vaughn could have fired me for any reason or none at all. Vaughn told me I was fired for abandoning my position, which has a clearly defined policy in the attendance section. The attendance policy states an employee is given two days absence without notifying the company before it's considered that you have voluntarily abandoned your position. I was fired within a half-day period and provided notification. Vaughn confirms I notified him in his written statement. I should need to argue my case a little further than this. Again, I only needed to provide a notification, not receive permission, not get approval from manager. None of that's in the policy. And in fact, asking permission and receiving approval would have violated it. Like if there's a policy that says you need to provide notification and then a little multiple choice question is like, A, should you provide notification or B, ask permission and wait for approval? The correct answer would be A, and B would be wrong. You'd get the test question wrong like they do, like the hearing officer does, like Bruce Carwas does, because they don't actually know their own policies. They just do whatever insane thing comes to their mind. The attendance, okay. The policy states I need to notify the manager for absence, not receive approval. Vaughn confirmed I notified him of the intended absence before leaving. Vaughn claimed he did not respond when I said I was leaving, and he claimed he did not give permission for me to leave. I provide the audio tape from that conversation, and Vaughn can clearly be heard saying the word all right after I tell him I'm leaving. This is both a response and a word used for giving permission. Receiving approval was not defined in any policy provided in relation to abandonment or the attendance policy. Hence, approval for an absence cannot be used as evidence of any violation of policy. Vaughn used walked off shift without approval as his reason for separation. I provide evidence I notified him in accordance with the attendance of the policy and that he replied with approval. Simone, Vaughn, and Amanda have made a concerted effort to deceive the deputy that I was late that morning. When I was asked why I was considered late, clocking in at 7.58 a.m. while scheduled at 8 a.m., the deputy was only provided with the definition of the word on time, understood to mean arrive five mean to mean arriving five minutes early. That does not define what is considered to be late. They omitted several sections of the attendance policy. In this instance, PDF 25 questions number one and two. The deputy specifically asked for the policy that defines when I am late. The term late is only used once in the attendance policy. So initially, they did not even provide the full attendance policy. They asked, what's the late policy? And they say, oh, on time means five minutes early. On time is five minutes early. That's, that's late. Provided policy to establish when I'm late. On time is in a neat, clean, and complete breach of course uniform five minutes before it's on your shift. Omitted section that actually establishes when I'm late. If you are going to be late for work or absent, notify the manager as far in advance as, pos- as is feasible under circumstances, but before the start of your shift. The start time is clearly established in both sections as my scheduled time. I can call the management before the start of my shift. This proves I had until 7.59 a.m. to make the call and would not yet have been considered late. If I am not already late at 7.59 a.m., I cannot feasibly be considered late clocking in before that time. You'll note a phone call is not even specified, only notification. So me walking in the building uh, would have been providing notification. Hence, walking in the door before starting my shift will allow time to notify managed accordance with the policy. Then Amanda began writing the actual policy in her written statement. Why was the section that defines being late omitted when requested? Oh, we're not going to get an answer to that. You know, all of the times I've clocked in in the past four years would be after the five-minute early point and before the start of my shift. They confirm there are only a few instances of me clocking in before or after that five-minute time frame. I had arrived and walked in the door up until the start of my shift without being considered late many times. 
and that is what policy allows. How is management keeping track of my arrival time outside of the time clock? Because if we just go by the time clock, oh, there's nothing weird about what I did that morning. I provided my absentee record for the year of 2019 up until 11, 13, 19. During that year, management did not log a single tardy, and I had only two sick days. Yet I have hundreds of clock in times after the on time is early policy. Why did they not log those instances as being late or tardy? Hmm, I guess I've never been tardy before. Maybe I was just confused. The time I clock in is what establishes my attendance. In my recording, Vaughn stated an employee does not need to clock in five minutes early, only arrive at that time. The clock in time is how Brisu Car Wash tracks my attendance, not a manager as I walk in the door. The time I arrive on site is not recorded and cannot be verified via the record keeping method. If any employee could have registered a clock in time of 7.59 a.m. and been considered on time, any clock in time equal or better than that must have must be respected equally. The clock in time compared to the scheduled time should always clearly indicate an if, if an employee was late. I estimate I would have at least 800 days during my four-year work period in the same time frame as that morning. How does my clock in time indicate I was late? Yep, it doesn't. I provided the last contact I had with Justin Salisbury in relation to the harassment policy. It would show that I attempted to contact Justin and only knew I would not receive a response after the point of separation. I would have had to escalate to John Agnew after separation as well. I first reported my concerns to Vaughn that morning. All other contacts made were at my discretion and do not show a violation of policy. One final note, I included photos of the company's uniform policy taken in 2018 at work. I request a breeze through providing a screenshot or video of the conversation between me and between me, Vaughn, and I, okay, between me, Vaughn, and I that morning on 01 2720 if they intend to lie about Vaughn being in uniform, the uniform policy states employees not wearing the appropriate uniform will not be allowed to work. So he's not in uniform. He's not allowed to work. He's not allowed to be there coaching me about scoffing and being early. And oh, he's not not harassing me. I'm just I'm just being managed. Oh, okay, the uniform policy states not, will not be allowed to work. The attendance policy states on time is being in a neat, clean, and complete Brisu Car Wash uniform. Was Vaughn in uniform while working that morning or during his conversation with me? Does Vaughn claim he knew he was following all the company policies in the handbook that morning? I bet he would. I bet he would. Two employees are working, one in uniform, the other out of uniform. Which employee would be expected to accurately know the company policies as provided in this case? I'm going to go with the in, in uniform employee. It seems Vaughn has been caught out of uniform. I asked that they provide a photo or video from that morning if they intend to dispute this fact. If they do not dispute this fact, it verifies Vaughn did not completely understand the policies. Mm, tragic. So all of this information was available to the deputy. You know, I have many questions. None of this would really get asked at the hearing, but the hearing was actually a lot shorter than I expected. We didn't cover a single audio recording. We didn't cover a single question I asked, but I'm gonna I'm about to get into this hearing and we're gonna go into this. Just in case anyone wanted. So I do have a 30-minute recording. Um I have like a 30 minute recording of the hearing too, but this is a conversation between myself, Vaughn, and Simone Tilly. I just want to cover a couple aspects of that because after you just heard, Simone was constantly saying like I was the one buying violating policy. It wasn't contacting the right people. I kept trying to contact her and Denise. They're too incompetent to do anything. I needed to contact Justin. I didn't do it, even though I did. So let's just take a look at this recording from her. Okay, so I'm going to play some of this audio recording. Um, I'd just like to note they were accusing me of exploding um, during a previous conversation with Vaughn. This is what led up to this meeting. Um, in fact, what happened is he had been continuously harassing me about this training, which, again, I'd already completed years prior. What I actually needed was a manager on site to simply sign off on the training I was already doing. I was already doing pretty much everything in the training log. All the, all the training was actually related to specific tasks um, like repairs, and loading cars, and I'd already done all of it years previously, and I'd done almost all of it again at this point. Like, I'd already completed half the training again, and now this manager, who I'm going to prove skipped all the training himself, with a little quote in here, but again, Simone is saying that I was contacting all the wrong people. Here she is at the end of the meeting. Let's see what she has to say. You've got frustrations, then. Talk to Mom. Don't get, do all the 
Well, she has no idea what you're talking about, but you'll know she says, ah, if you're having an issue with Bon, go to him, wait for an answer, but if you're, but if that doesn't work out, come to me, come to me. That was one month or two months before I was terminated, I was receiving the coaching. I should be going to Simone after I'm having an issue with Vaughn. Interesting. Okay, so here's just another little clip from this thing. I would just like to note that this manager who claims to know all the policies com um, completely skipped this retraining. The company restarted everyone on their advanced training. I was already two years deep into it. Again, one module away, maybe a month, two months away. Pretty easy to get. Um, and then they restarted all. Oh, denying me a raise. Now, this person had arrived at the car wash um, a few months before I had. And so they had completed their advanced training a little bit faster than me, already gotten a raise, and already gone to management. So they were able to just skip all that retraining. You don't need that. But here, let's let's listen to it for yourself. We changed the advanced manual, and we had to start show over. I think Kate Jacob was still here for a whole year after that. Yeah, yeah. So what exactly? There, was... there was no hold up then, and that's exactly how I made it through. I think for six modules, I, I made it through. That's half the training. I guess not believe that the company when they were lying to me in the first place. So, I mean, I was being told I was making progress towards my advance. Uh, I was told it was a company-wide restart, but to use you as an example, right, if everyone got restarted on their training, I mean, you never had to redo any training. Okay, I became manager, and I had to learn everything. Right, but you didn't need someone else to, like, sign off on your training. And, and even on that note, the person who was signing off on your training wasn't even signed off on your training. That's, uh, that's not a serious training program. No, no other training program on the planet is going to have someone who's not signed off on their own training, okay. signing other people's training. Well, okay, uh, I, I do want to apologize on the company's behalf. I mean, it sounds yeah, like... I know, it's not. Okay, so let's break that down. So I say, oh, you didn't have to redo any training. And he goes, oh, I became a manager. I, I learned everything. So the only hold up to my training program was, again, there was no actual manager with more training than me. They would have actually had to be into their expert training. Pretty much no one in the entire company could make it to this expert training, um, at least at the site I was working on. I'm pretty sure I maybe watched, like, one person do one thing and claim it was expert training, which would have been after the advanced but so I say, you didn't get restarted. You didn't have to redo any training. I became a manager. Yeah, that's not how that works, buddy. Again, everyone in the company was supposed to be restarted. And I, as I pointed out there, the original manager, he was in the same situation as I was. He had been there four years or close, maybe three years at the time. He had not completed his own advanced because guess what? He needed another manager to come sign off on his stuff. But he had to make phone calls and stuff to get them to do it. So... He wasn't even signed off. He was the one who completed this guy's training. How does a manager who hasn't completed his training fully complete this guy's training? And so this manager who, again, was signed off on by a manager who hadn't completed his training then skipped all the retraining, he's the one claiming the man, he's the one training the managers that I would later go on to have issues with that are accosting me outside of the front door and completely using all the policies wrong. So I'd just like to point out a couple of these little aspects here. They would, again, accuse me of how exploding during this having an episode or something, um, again, because I was trying to insist that and get the managers to understand in a previous conversation, not recorded, that, yeah, I wasn't going to be doing training during my lunches and breaks uh, because, like, I, I literally had been kept telling him, like, all we need to do is just schedule it. Just schedule the training. Like, it's usually associated with a repair task or some other task that's literally on the weekly or monthly maintenance or something. And so there's actually a time that gets done and then the managers have to be there as I was the employee doing a lot of this stuff. And then they just got to sign off on it afterwards. That's usually how the training works, but whatever. Here we go. Okay, I want you to just listen to this highlight from that same conversation with Simone and Vaughn. Compared to employees working at this point in time, I can compare my pay to employee working here for three months. I see. I wish he would have told me um, 
he was going to go talk to upper management about getting me a raise because, yeah, what I um, actually had happen was like, again, me telling him I wasn't going to be working through lunches and breaks, and apparently that's me exploding. Again, I, I if anything, maybe had like a tiny bit of a raise voice with him, but it was more just to try and like actually like knock a little sense into him. Like he was completely delusional, like, oh, yeah, lunches and breaks, man. We could definitely get through your training if you're willing to do that. Um, but yeah, you just heard him right there bringing up like, oh, but if you're going to get a lawyer about that back pay, which the company would probably legally owe you since I can prove that manager didn't have to restart his training during a company wide restart. Um, oh, okay. Well, actually going to the legal system, um, you're actually not supposed to be able to threaten an employee for that because they actually have every right to use the legal system. So usually threatening an employee for saying they're going to seek a legal restitution to a problem. Um, is actually illegal, but again, we're not going to be concerned about that in this case. Okay, I'm not going to be going through the hearing. Okay, I'm just going to start. So this is about um, 10 minutes into the hearing, and the testimony is actually about to start. They basically just entered in the documents I'd shown previously, the recordings I'd put in, and then some of the photos I'd taken from previous stuff, and like the company policy and stuff from the previous documentation. But here she is, I'm questioning the manager initially. All right, I'm going to start with the employer side first. I'm going to start with some basic background questions, like the dates of Mr. Keeney's employment, what his position and title was, rate of pay, that kind of information. Um, Ms. Tilly, do, should I start with you for the background information, or do you want me to start with Mr. Reed for that information? Uh, we could start with Vaughn for that information. Okay. All right, then, Mr. Mead, what do you have for the dates of Mr. Keeney's employment? Hold on one sec. I got to find that information. Looks like the uh, date of hire was January 20th, 2016. Okay. And what was the last day worked or date of separation? That would have been January 27th, 2020. And what was his ending position or title? Uh, CSA, which is customer service attendant. Okay. And did he work full time or part time? He was a full time worker. And who was his supervisor when he separated from the employer? That'd be me. I just want to point out that they sent Vaughn and Simone. So I had specifically stated that Vaughn was harassing me that morning. In the email, because of a previous interaction, I had actually written up that Simone, I already felt harassed by her. So again, management was just picking up the harassment. I had specifically in that email stated I felt both these managers were harassing me. They then coordinate my termination. Because what I would find out in this hearing, as we'll probably hear later, um, is that Simone was contacted about this golfing incident before I was. In fact, probably all of upper management was notified before I was. So I just want to point that out, um, that the two people who harassed me to leaving to the point of leaving for a day, um, and then and had actually been harassing me for several months, if not years prior to that, um, are now at this unemployment hearing. So I don't have to face the people who harass me. I'm still angry about this stuff, but whatever, right? Whatever about me. And what's his ending rate of pay? His ending rate of pay, I believe, was $18 an hour. And did the claimant quit? Was he laid off or was he discharged by the employer? Discharged. Discharged. Why was he discharged? Fired. You know? Um, uh, job abandonment. So I was discharged for job abandonment. They called me back in twice the same day. It's, it's just irritating. What happened? Uh, so I was talking to him. I was giving him feedback. Um, and he, how He's much did you tell me? Stuff. Not, not feedback. How much did you feedback. want to give me? Okay. So I was, I was giving him feedback about being late that morning. And uh, he wasn't having it. And he uh, left while he was at work, without my approval. He just left. So he just walked out of the meeting with you? Just left. Yeah, yeah he yeah. said, I'm, I'm going home. Okay. And then he just walked out of, the, of your office or wherever you guys were? After notifying yeah. everyone. Yeah, after, after notifying him um, at least twice and then the entire office, yeah. I then clocked out and left. Mm -hmm. Trying to take a single day off. He, did he give an explanation before he left as to why he was leaving? Yeah, he said he felt harassed. Forget about that. Forget about what an employee says harassed. That's completely meaningless. Just send him he in said to you were giving him feedback about being late that morning. What had happened with him being late? 
So at Breeze Through, we have a policy. It's five minutes early, ready to work um, uh, for your shifts. Um, Doesn't say have to be at work. was, I believe, two minutes late. So he arrived three minutes early. And I uh, attempted to talk to him about it. So actually... So... He just said I arrived three minutes early. And that sounds like my side of the story. So yeah, and this is why I was getting irritated because I've got multiple managers talking to me about being three minutes early. Like yeah, that's called harassment. About it first. They're and storming outside the front of the building. Later when I arrived to get me. And so that when she tried to give him feedback, he had walked away from her and just stated that he wasn't late. And then I talked to Keeney, or tried to talk to Keeney. He walked away from me. Uh, when I tried to give him feedback, I pulled him to the office. And we had a conversation about um, just. So I'd like to be clear in that first five minute recording, I just feel free to go listen to that again. No mention of me walking away at all. This guy is going to act like I was walking away from everyone, which is probably technically true. If you want to be like, I take one step in one direction, I'm walking away from half the planet, walking towards half the planet. I just happen to be walking away from them in that instance, I guess. He receives feedback, just being more respectful with it, because honestly, it wasn't a big deal being two minutes late. It was just the way he was reacting towards it. And uh, I, I was just giving feedback about that and said he's feeling harassed. And I believe the whole, I believe my whole statement is, and one of the documentation comes back as well. If you need more detail. Had you had similar interactions with Mr. Keeney that you'd had that day? Um, there, well, there was a situation, at least like a couple years ago, but I don't remember enough about it to give you a, a good enough statement. Okay. So when, um, what? So in that previous instance, I had actually arrived late that morning, like a couple minutes past my schedule time or something. I was about to pull into work. This was at like 5 a.m. in the morning. I was really not expecting too much grief for it. But in that instance, Von Mead decided to call me. And like, I was literally driving up to the store, right, as he was calling me. And he was like enraged on the phone, like, what is going on? No employee's ever been two minutes late here without making a phone call. And so I was like really disturbed walking in there. And this is what happened. And so there he was giving me grief. I kept telling him, just write it up. Just write it up. This manager would not write up anything. In previous instances, the manager, even when giving me a verbal warning, claiming I did some policy violation, would write up that verbal warning. I didn't get that many, but I actually had some write-ups for being late. They all would have been beyond my schedule time. Every single time they would have been beyond my schedule time. And so that morning I was just saying, write it up, dog. I don't feel like hearing about this anymore. Like, yeah, I was two minutes late, didn't make a phone call. But there's actually a little, you just put a little T in the section. That would be mark me as tardy or whatever, making no no call. But this was like 15 minutes of once again me being like berated and being completely condescending. In that instance, I was late. I was overly apologetic, probably apologized like 40 times. Like, oh my, I'm so sorry I'm late, man. Wouldn't drop it. I finally walked out that door saying something like, I can't believe you can't even be effing like one minute later around here. Um, no real repercussions from that that I'm aware of. I was able to just return to work the next day. Didn't take a day off. So in fact, the previous instance proved that I was free to just leave work and show back up. Um, according to that instance, we had a meeting later, and uh, we just said, yeah, sorry about all that, and there you go. So that was a previous incident. Mr. Keeney said, I'm going home and walked out. You took that as he was, that was just it. He wasn't asking for permission to go home because he was upset or anything like that? No, he didn't ask for permission. He just said he was going to go home. Again, asking permission would not have complied with the company policy. Providing notification, which I definitely did, would. And so... As far as the employer's policy is concerned, if, if an employee walks out of the shift without permission, is that determined to be job abandonment then? Yes. There's no, there's no policy that states that. I just showed you the attendance policy provided. I don't think I have any more questions for you right now, Mr. Mead. Is completely there anything else insane. you want to add or tell me completely about? Completely insane. Um, no, not at this time. Okay. Uh, Ms. Tilly, do you have any questions you want to ask Mr. Mead? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Mr. Keeney, any questions for Ms., uh, Mr. Mead? Um, yeah, I do have a question. Um, what policy states walking out? 
removable. Would it be considered job abandonment? The only policy on job abandonment they have two days without notification. Sorry, I'm just going to replay this here. Uh, Ms. Tilly, do you have any questions you want to ask Mr. Mead? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Mr. Keeney, any questions for Ms., uh, Mr. Mead? Um, yeah, I do have a question. Um, what policy states locking out without approval would it be considered job abandonment? The only policy on job abandonment states I have two days without notification. Hmm. Um, that, what? That's for. No, 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 Mrs. Till, you can't answer for Mr. Mead. You can only have Mr. Mead answer right now. An answer. If Mr. Mead doesn't know the answer to the question, just say, Mr. Mead, you don't know the answer, and so, it, it could be better directed to Ms. Tilly than just say that. And the we'll defense attorney. That when it comes the defense attorney class. here, that hearing officer, playing defense attorney. You can just say, I don't know. I don't know the answer. You don't know what policy you're operating off of. You have the policies right here on the back. Do you want to ask Mr. Mead? Um, yeah, sure. Why well, is he working out of uniform? Like, if he's claiming to, to know the one. policies, you'll notice the on-time policy says in uniform five minutes early. Why, why was he working out of uniform that morning? Um, I don't recall uh, being out of uniform. I don't recall. He says he doesn't recall being out of uniform? That I don't know that morning. Okay. All right. All the questions I got. He was definitely out of uniform, so there you go. Mr. Kitty, don't give testimony during fact examination, please. Okay. Uh, Ms. Tilly, I'm going to come to you now. Um, how did you become aware of the situation with Mr. Keeney? Um, I became aware of the situation um, that morning when Vaughn had called me and told me about Jacob's interaction with Amanda. Um, and ask for some guidance on how to coach Jacob to have a better attitude about the situation. You don't know how tough I was to coach? Okay. And, you know, was this before or after he had uh, pulled Mr. Keeney into the office? Um, this was before that. Okay. And, and what advice did you give him? Just to make sure to read Jacob's pro scan before you talk to him and then just to find out kind of where he is his mind was that as far as why he would think that it's okay to scoff at your supervisor and walk away um, instead of being an adult and have an adult conversation. Ooh. Like, so you'll just notice how condescending this manager is. So I'm adult because I, I'm not an adult. I'm a child now because I arrived three minutes early and answered her questions as she walked in and then she storms off completely. And ridiculous. then how did you find out that Mr. Keeney had walked out of the meeting? Uh, Vaughn called me. I didn't necessarily walk out of the meeting. I left after about a notification. After, not, it's not um, a walk Jacob off. Had walked out. And it's what did you guys discuss in that they call? Are. He just told me how the conversation went um, and that Jacob was very uh, defensive and, and not willing They're to listen a lot of to anything Vaughn really had to say. They are patently um, wrong about their policies. That he was leaving and walked out. And did you guys both at that time make the decision that Mr. Keeney had, um, would be discharged for this behavior, or how did that decision come about? Uh, it came about through just having that conversation, and, um, you know, if, if you've been in your position, that's not very professional, so we've made the decision to just let him go at that time. Thanks, Ms. I don't have any more questions I can think of right now. Is there anything else you wanted to add or respond to? No, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Kenny, do you have any questions for Ms. Tilly? Um, not at this time. Okay. All right, then, Mr. Kenny, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to start with the same background questions first. <coughs> Excuse me. So were your dates of employment January 20th of 2016 through January 27th of 2020? Yes. And you were working as a customer service attendant? Correct. And you worked full-time? Yes. And was Mr. Mead your direct supervisor when you separated from the employer? Yes. Was your ending rate of pay $18 an hour? Yes, correct. And were you, in fact, discharged by the employer? Um, yes. Vaughn called me back for a meeting that day and terminated me. Uh, okay. What were you told was the reason for your termination? Um, yeah, abandoned my position. 
Um, can you tell me what you remember happening that day? Um, yeah, so basically I arrived there a few minutes early before my shift, um, went to clock in. I was not expecting any issues. It's like, it's not uncommon for me to arrive like a couple minutes after the five in the early period, though I was typically showing up early and waiting. Um, Amanda approached me from outside, kind of coming up from the parking lot asking questions. I answered her questions outside. I walked in and clocked in. She followed me in, repeating the same questions. I answered all of them. Hmm. Um, I then went to go grab a radio and Amanda made kind of like an odd noise and like she exited the building and walked back outside. I would like to point out that in the recording I provided, Vaughn never mentioned me walking away from Amanda. That's like one of my infractions. They kind of just tacked that on later. Um, So I went out about my day. I had several more interactions with Amanda. She did not raise any concerns to me at that time. I figured it was just over, just kind of an awkward interaction in the morning. Um, Vaughn approached me about an hour later as I was cleaning windows in the office. Um, and I would say he approached me in such a serious tone, I felt the need to start recording immediately. So I pulled out my phone and started recording because he referenced like some interaction with Amanda that was seemingly serious that I, I, I didn't personally pick up on. I did attempt to talk to him um, for so several minutes. He called quick. me into the office, like immediately accused me of taking it zero to 60. He may have been referring to me starting recording. Um, I, I clearly stated like I had until eight o'clock the time I shift to make a phone call. Like I shouldn't have been getting asked about making a phone call. I shouldn't have been considered late that morning. The late policy in the attendance section clearly states I have to the start of my shift until I'm considered late. Um, I made it clear to Vaughn on several instances that I felt I was being harassed. Um, he started getting condescending repeatedly and falsely accusing me of being late. Um, I told him I was leaving very specifically for the day, and he said, all right, I have provided a recording of such. After I stopped the recording, the conversation continued on for a couple of sentences mm. where he questioned why I was working there. I again stated I felt the need to leave for the day, and he again said it was all right. The last words I remember him saying were like, all right, man, take care of yourself. Hmm. Hmm. Doesn't sound like a case. Why did you feel it necessary to home? leave that day? Um, this had been like an ongoing issue with Vaughn. Um, it was it was basically just being continually ignored. Like I would raise concerns, continually ignored. Often just met with a condescending attitude, like I was that morning. So like part of the part of the job description involves me smiling and being friendly. If I don't feel I can do that, I I do feel like I have to take the day mm-hmm. off. I can't, their, their policy is they have to be able to smile, so they come in harass you, you can't smile. You're going to be violating their no-smiling policies. Oh, no. Were you aware that um, walking out on your shift is considered job abandonment? It, there is no legal definition for the term job abandonment. The standard definition for job abandonment is three days, no call, no show. Without notification. I, I notified Vaughn, and he contends that in his written statement. But so you're aware if you leave your shift without approval that it's considered job abandonment? That's your question. I believe I've received approval. I'm not asking about what, I'm not, I'm just asking in general, the general concept. Not oh, general. no, 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 I did not know that. The, the company policy clearly states the abandonment is just two days without notification. Nothing, nothing about approval. Forget about those policies. Forget about that. So whether, whether or not I got approval, like, I don't ask for approval when I get sick. I just call and tell them I'm, I'm taking a sick day. I can actually prove that. I've never needed message. approval for an announcements report. I didn't say, can I take a sick day? I just said, taking a sick day. And they'd say, okay, all right. Locally don't agree. I don't think I have any more questions, actually, for you, Mr. Keeney, right now. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or respond so, to? You'll notice, like, as long as um, early means late, um, all right means no, not giving permission, job abandonment is actually just taking a day off. Just a patent day off is job abandonment. It's pretty clear to see how I lost after this. Let me just see here how this continues. Um, that, that covered the morning. Okay. Miss Tilly, do you have any questions you want to ask Mr. Keeney? No, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Vaughn, is there anything you want to add in closing? No, ma'am. Okay. Miss Tilly, anything you want to add or respond to in closing? No, ma'am. 
Mr. Kay, anything you want to add in closing? Uh, no. Okay. We will go. Okay, so there's the hearing. I'm not going to follow up on that, how that turned out. Of course, I would end up losing this, and I would end up appealing and losing that appeal as well. Small spoiler. Ah, okay, this is the hearing officer's right up after the case. Okay, so I'm just going to read through some of this nonsense here. So, statement of the case. Jacob A. Keeney, the claimant, appeared for this hearing by telephone. The employer appeared for this hearing by telephone. Appearing as a witness on behalf of the employer were Simone Tilly and Von Mead. There were no other appearance for this hearing. The hearing was held on April 24th, 2020 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, before hearing officer Williams. The hearing officer entered three claimant exhibits of evidence. The hearing officer entered into one division, exhibited into evidence. No exhibits were entered for the employer. So they literally provided no evidence. I would like to be clear, all of their statements were verbal statements. They then provided like my initial training manual or something, had very little information in it. That was where that like five minutes on time policy was from. But again, absolutely no evidence. And in fact, they wouldn't even provide the video or the picture that would prove the manager was out of uniform, not following policy. It's like, if he's out, if he's not there as a manager, um, out of uniform, or if he's not there as a manager in uniform, then you can't really be coaching me. Hearing officer held the hearing because the employer appealed a decision issued by a deputy of the Division of Unemployment Insurance. The deputy granted the claimant an award of unemployment insurance benefits pursuant to Section 873-8014-C.R.S. The deputy determined the claimant was not at fault for separation from this employer. The hearing officer must determine whether the claimant is entitled to unemployment insurance benefits under Colorado law based on the cause of the separation from employment. The hearing officer reverses the deputy's decisions based on the findings and conclusions stated below. Let's see what happened here. The claimant worked for the employment as a full-time customer service center from January 20, um, 2016 to January 27, 2020. The claimant supervisor was Mr. Mead, and his ending rate of pay was $18 an hour. The claimant was discharged. Again, they would go into the system, in the unemployment system, and change it to me quitting. They would change it to me quitting. Um, was discharged by the employer because he walked off the job after arguing with his supervisors. I'm actually going to say I didn't really argue. Um, they said I scoffed. I said, I'm going to scoff if I'm getting asked about making a phone call when I'm arriving early. Um, not really a confession, but I then even said I would make a phone call uh, if I was actually going to be one minute late. I'm going to say I didn't actually argue too much. I basically said I feel harassed and was then completely ignored. But okay. The claimant was discharged by the employer because he walked off the job to argue with supervisors. The employer's attendance policy requires employers to be at work, ready to work, five minutes before their schedule shift. The claimant was aware of this policy. It does not say I need to be at work. It says I need to be in a neat, clean uniform um, five minutes before the start of my shift. It doesn't actually say I need to be clocked in. It doesn't say I need to be there. And again, the way they enforced it was um, to actually get wage theft and time theft. On January 27th, the claimant was scheduled to work at 8 a.m. The claimant showed up to work at 7.57 a.m., making him two minutes late. Ooh, got me. Amanda, the assistant manager, attempted to talk to the claimant about why he was late, and the claimant scoffed at her. Amanda reported the incident to Mr. Mead. That should have been on camera. I mean, let's get this let's get this scoff on um, into the trial, shall we, and just review this. Mr. Mead brought the claimant into the office, which, actually, if you had that video, you would plainly see she walked away from me. And she was the one reacting to basically being told, no, I didn't make a phone call. That was the correct answer. I didn't make a phone call. It wasn't me being rude. Mr. Mead brought the claimant into the office to discuss what happened with Amanda. The claimant became very agitated in the meeting. Mr. Mead tried to explain to the claimant that it wasn't a big deal that he was late, but his reaction to Amanda asking him about being late wasn't appropriate. The claimant became increasingly upset and agitated during the meeting. Okay, so she's acknowledging I'm becoming upset by his responses and his actions, but that's not okay for me. You can't, literally that would be like the first time ever I've actually left the job site because I was being harassed. That's not okay for me. You can't have you can't have emotions as a human being. So the claimant became increasingly upset and after your meeting, the claimant said, I'm leaving for the day. Honestly, I feel harassed. I don't know what to tell you, man. This is just crazy, and walked out. Mr. Mead said, All right. She acknowledges Mr. Mead said, All right, in exasperation as to how things escalated during the meeting with the claimant. The claimant did not have permission to walk off the job. The claim was discharged by the employer as a result. Completely insane. I'll read a little more from that. So, so section um, 873.1 provides for a disqualification of unemployment insurance benefits from this employer when the reason for separation is rude, insolent, or offensive behavior by a worker, not reasonably to be countenanced under circumstances by customer, supervisor, or fellow worker. So, allegedly, my arrival early 
the allegation I scoffed, and my attempt to take a day off, again, with 121 hours of PTO, after I said very clearly I felt like I was being harassed, and again, none of my concerns were addressed during this entire process ever. My side of the story was not even fairly considered during this time, and all right being said in exasperation does not actually change the meaning of the word all right. It doesn't make it no. Okay, so they're saying disqualified being rude. That's pretty, it just keeps saying, like, if you actually were to count the amount of negative language in this, there are hundreds to thousands of negative words being used against me. Again, all because I showed up early that day and tried to take a day off. Some of the some of the facts presented by the parties were in sharp conflict in this matter, requiring a credibility determination. That is actually this hearing officer's job. She is supposed to be an investigator. She is completely incompetent and a failure. And she is the one supposed to be determining credibility. She should have been asking questions herself if she had any, because she's the one making the decision. This does not mean that the hearing officer did not consider all of the testimony, only that the hearing officer was required to resolve the conflicts of the evidence in the record. So some of the evidence is in sharp conflict, some of the facts are in sharp conflicts, but she had to resolve the conflicts in the evidence. She did none of that. The resolution of the conflicts in the evidence and the termination of the credibility of the witnesses are matters left to the hearing officer. So I guess I just wasn't credible enough. So, go on a little bit, then it says, a hearing officer is not required to address specific evidence or testimony. He or she does not find persuasive or make specific credibility determinations. So literally, she's just like writing herself like, oh, I don't have to do this. Citations omitted, Tilly versus Industrial Claims, Office of State of Colorado, um, some number there, 924p.2d1173. Oh, okay. The hearing officer concludes that the claim is at fault for a separation. Although the claimant testified that Mr. Mead saying all right after he said he was leaving gave him permission to leave his shift, the hearing officer is not persuaded. I only had to provide notification according to policies, but again, the policies have now just been chucked out the window. Even standard definitions like job abandonment, which are typically three days no call, no show. That's the standard consideration of that. We're just done with that. Amanda asking the claimant why he was late was not objectively unsatisfactory. Well, it is when you're early. The claimant scoffing at Amanda when she asked him why he was late was not reasonable under the circumstances. Mr. Mead coaching the claimant about how he responded to Amanda asking him about being late was not objectively unsatisfactory. To the extent that Mr. Mead said all right in response to the claimant's outburst. Crazy. I didn't know that conversation was an outburst. It was said in exasperation because of how things had escalated in the meeting with the claimant. Well, it takes two people to escalate things, not one, necessarily. The claimant's entire attitude when approached by Amanda through his meeting with Mr. Mead was objectively insolent. Was she there? Did Amanda say I was insolent, or did she say I scoffed? Hmm. So, a scoff is now objective insolent. Being early to work, that's pure insolence. I don't know what I was thinking there. The claimant walking out during his shift was not reasonable under the circumstances. Well, what's all that PTO for? Well, I... I can't feel harassed? Okay. The claimant did not have permission to leave work during his shift. Forget about that, all right. Forget about my claim that the recording, that I was still at work for several minutes after and made sure everything was fine before I left as I did every other time. Oh. The claimant did not have permission to leave work during his shift. The claimant having an outburst and walking out during his shift was objectively insolent. Just, like, they are going completely insane here. Like, am I wrong? Like, pro provide the video evidence. Provide, you should be able to probably see insolence on a video. The hearing officer has considered the testimony of the witnesses and finds the employer's testimony to be both credible and persuasive. They lie and they lie and they lie, but they're credible and persuasive. The hearing officer finds the claimant's testimony unpersuasive. The hearing officer has considered the totality of the circumstances involved in the claimant separation and based on the totality of the circumstances, the term as the claimant is not entitled to award benefits. So again, as long as taking a single day off is now just patently job abandonment, just hammer that through. The hearing officer was clearly out to get me because, again, she went back in the system and changed it to me having quit. The employer says I was discharged. I wrote an email that day to Justin Salisbury saying, hey, I was just fired by the boss. But now, according to this hearing officer, I have quit. Then ends the hearing officer decision. The hearing officer determines the claimant is not entitled to benefits for separation from this employer. The division issues its qualification under 8 73 1085 E XIV CRS. That, of course, is um, I'll just read that once just so you can see um, when they are rude, insolent, or offensive behavior by a worker. Okay. 
I don't know. I don't see how anyone can possibly collect unemployment benefits if leaving work is automatic insolence and job abandonment. Okay, so I was going to go into my appeal. I thought it was in my Google Drive, but it may actually be on another computer. I'd actually just kind of copied and pasted it into one of the forms for the employment office and sent it to them. Um, so I don't have a copy of my what I actually wrote to appeal, but believe me, it included basically all of this information and more where I actually even give them like specific quotes from like text and stuff and like basically prove my side of the story entirely. That Brisu Karosh is fabricating how they were using this policy, everything about it they were fabricating. And then I even gave them like examples of them like going crazy, firing other employees under weird, um, similar circumstances. One of who was the um, safety officer for the company. Um, and like what had actually happened is she called me up and I did a painting for her. And I sold it to her for like 40 bucks or whatever, um, like a few weeks after I'd been fired. At that point in time, I, I ex always expected from this company, I knew the upper management didn't like me because I just would not tolerate their nonsense. Uh, myself and many other employees, I'm trying to stand up to those people for the years, but like they were utterly delusional to a point where they would actually be coaching employees to stare into the sun out there while they're trying to load cars. There would be very bright glare on the windshield, and they'd be like, yeah, just stare into that and smile. It's going to be great, and you're going to be fine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the final decision. Um, I'll try and track down that document and go over another time. But well, quickly, I'm going to show you this decision from them, and I'll read it. Okay, so I apologize. I can't actually go over my appeal um, specifically, but believe me, I brought up all those specific policies. <laughs> I brought up all this nonsense. I brought up each and every instance they're lying, and let's see how many of my concerns were addressed. The claimant appeals the April 30th, 2020 decision of the hearing officer that disqualified the claimant from award of benefits pursuant to 873-801. The claimant engaged in rude, insolent, or offensive behavior. We affirm the decision of the hearing officer. The claimant works for the employer at his car wash facility as a customer service attendant until January 27th, 2020. The hearing officer determined the claimant was discharged on that date. Again, discharged, not me quitting, because he walked off the job after arguing with the supervisor. The claimant is required to arrive at work five minutes prior to beginning work with the car wash customers. That's not what the policy says. On January 27th, the claimant arrived at work two minutes late, which was three minutes before he was to begin working with customers at 8 a.m. The hearing officer found Amanda, the assistant manager, attempted to talk to the claimant about why he was late, and the claimant scoffed at her. Well, I mean, a scoff is technically rude by definition. If you actually want to watch, like, a Seinfeld, a Seinfeld episode with the subtitles on, you're going to see the word scoff, like, every other scene, because it's just, like, Oh, oh, wow, insolence now, unemployment benefits denied. And I probably did less than what you just saw. They're even spelling this guy's last name wrong. They clearly don't care. Um, claimant Scoffter, Amanda reported the incident to Vaughn Mead, the site manager. Mr. Mead met with the claimant to discuss the episode. See, this is where, like, I start getting enraged. The episode involving Amanda. The hearing officer found the claimant became very agitated in the meeting. Mm, really? It was noted that when Mr. Mead tried to explain to the claimant that it wasn't a big deal that he was late, but that his reaction to Amanda asking him about being late wasn't appropriate, the claimant became increasingly upset and agitated during the meeting, said, I'm leaving for the day. Honestly, I feel harassed. I don't know what to tell you, man. This is just crazy, and walked out. The hearing officer found Mr. Mead said, all right, in exasperation as to how things have escalated during the meeting with the claimant. Maybe been a weird cut there. Sorry, just showing me that page. The hearing officer found that the claimant did not have permission to walk off the job, and the claimant was discharged by the employer as a result. So again, uh, I'm going to say about like 99% of this is like completely fabricated and completely disproved by the evidence. Again, the word "all right" has to mean no. Um, walking off your shift has to be taking a day off with 120 hours of PTO. Okay, the hearing officer concluded the claimant was at fault for the job separation. The hearing officer was not persuaded by the claimant's testimony. He felt the statement by Mr. Mead of all right after the claimant stated he was leaving his shift amounted to permission for the claimant to leave. Only had to provide notification, not get permission. Getting permission would not have been following the policy. The hearing officer found Mr. Mead's expression was said in exasperation because of how things had escalated in the meeting with the claimant. The hearing officer resolved it was not objectively unsatisfactory for Amanda to inquire of the claimant why he was two minutes late on January 27th, and the claimant scoffed when she questioned him why he was not a reasonable, okay, sorry, which he questioned which was not a reasonable response under circumstances. 
Similarly, the hearing officer ruled the coaching Mr. Mead directed at the claimant's response to Amanda was not objectively unsatisfactory. The claimant's entire attitude when approached by Amanda and continuing through his meeting with the claimant's act of having an outburst and walking out during his shift was also seen by the hearing officer as objectively insolent. Well, what about when they called me and I returned to work at their request to be fired? Is that insolent? Because that was actually the point of separation. They actually keep using me leaving that morning as a point of separation when the actual point of separation was when I returned to work that day at their request. So these people are completely delusional and they are just all lying scumbags. David G. Kroll, Lisa Clyde, Lucia Williams, Ron Mead, Simone Tilly, John, Janice Agnew, and Justin Salisbury for sure. Simone Tilly, if I forgot her. The hearing officer noted the employer's testimony to have been persuasive while that of the claimant was not. What about the evidence? They didn't provide any. Upon consideration of the totality of the evidence, the hearing officer determined the claimant was not entitled to an award of benefits. The hearing officer cited to 873-108 to, to deny benefits. Provides for its qualification for rude, instead of offensive behavior, not to reason the accountants. And they, they really like just copying and pasting in that I was just rude. And this, this little um, 873-108. On appeal, the claimant contends the circumstances do not indicate insulate on his part and that he did not violate any policies of the employer. Crazy. That seems to be quite the distinction. And only one of us can be right. I just want to read this, though. The claimant's entire attitude when approached by Amanda and continuing through his meeting with the claimant's act of having an outburst and walking out during his shift was also seen by the hearing officer as objectively insolent. That's one sentence. These people are insane. Okay, back here, sorry. He maintains that he did not violate any of the policies of the employer. He maintains that he had accumulated sufficient time off hours. What is that? To request the remainder of the day off and that Mr. Mead gave his permission when he replied to the request by stating, all right, man, take care of yourself. So again, they acknowledge that he, in this instance, would have said, all right, twice, but whatever. The claimant argues the excessive attention devoted to his arrival two minutes late for work, actually three minutes early, and actually eight minutes early by my clock that morning. Um, but again, they, they kept asking me, what was I fired for? Not like, what actually happened? What did they fire you for? Oh, job abandoned. Okay, well, that's what happened. And Mr. Mead gave his permission. We replied to the question, all right, man, take care of yourself. The claimant argues the excessive attention. Okay, read that. Um, two minutes was unjustified, and it was reasonable for him to point that out to Mr. Mead and to Amanda. I never pointed that out to Amanda. All I did was answer her questions. The claimant devotes a considerable amount of time, considerable amount of detail to his history with the employer's management to indicate he was harassed for reasonable behavior. Very little of this account was included in either the testimony, either hearing testimony, or in the admitted exhibits. Actually, during that 30-minute recording, I actually mentioned quite a few things, and I the only evidence I included that was included was text messages that would implicitly prove that I asked to take a day off the same way every time. And when I say asked, I mean provided notification in compliance with the company policy. Um, and then just statements of fact that happened after the fact. Like, they kept on going crazy with employees, and at least one of them texted me, so I included that information. And they did have the op option to remand this back to the hearing officer. Now, this is um, the review of the panels restricted to the evidence presented to the hearing officer in the hearing. Uh, it was a pretty short hearing. So, not, so they're saying, consequently, we may not consider any additional factual assertions the claimant has made on appeal. So they're just saying the evidence is no good. Forget about that. Like what we're just stamping through. That is law. Well, that is gospel. It's the hearing officer's responsibility to determine the proximate or motivating cause of separation from employment, which then establishes entitlement to unemployment benefits under the statute. Uh, see Federico versus Brandon Sand and Gravel Co. Uh, some more numbers. As we understand the hearing officer's decision, she found that the claimant was discharged for his attitude and behavior, including walking out during his shift without permission, with question about being late. Since this finding is supported by the evidence, we may not change it was discharged for that. Well, again, she was actually claiming I abandoned my position, not that I was discharged um, at all. The, the hearing officer was insistent I was abandoned. The, you can see that I was fired for job abandonment. Completely absurd. Um, may not change it. See Paro versus Industrial Claims Appeal. You know, if, I, if only I'd had these case references beforehand. Like, it's funny how they're able to include these case references after the fact. I guess I just have to accept it. It is therefore those circumstances that determine the claimant's 
entitlement. Because being unemployed in this country, you got to be very, very entitled for something like that. The hearing officer ruled the claimant's arguing with his supervisor over their dissatisfaction with his target arrival at work and his hasty decision to then announce his intent to take the rest of the day off were rude and insolent actions. A reasonable supervisor could find the juxtaposition of these events in close proximity to each other represent an insolent response to a reasonable supervision. We are bound by the hearing officer's evidentiary findings that are not contrary to the weight of the evidence. Again, so many lies, and I literally pointed them out in the documentation saying blatant lie here, they're lying here. They were never once asked if they were lying, and again, it is the hearing officer's job to investigate this nonsense. It's not actually my job to fight all this evidence. The hearing officer should have been taking whatever evidence she needed. She needs to be making credibility determinations. So if I say the manager's out of uniform, she should have been like, oh, were you out of uniform? Why can't you answer that question? Doesn't the company have a uniform policy when you show up to work? Okay, we may not reweigh, reweigh the factual record and enter findings of our own or draw inferences different from those of the hearing officers. So they're literally saying they can't have a different opinion than the hearing officer, then what's the point of me appealing? Rather, it is solely the responsibility of the hearing officer to weigh the evidence, to assess credibility, to resolve conflicts in the evidence, and to determine the inferences to be drawn. Again, we did not listen to a single recording during that thing. We did not review an actual single policy. They instead just conjured up policies on the spot. And when I disagreed with them, uh, I was just told, no, 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 job abandonment, that's you walking out. If you walked off your shift, it doesn't matter how many times they said all right, or if you were following the company policy of notification. That's like the same thing as two, two days no call, no show. Oh, and you came back to work? Well, just forget about that. Forget about that. That's insolence. Okay, so here the hearing officer weighed the evidence, and her resulting factual findings are not contrary to the weight of the evidence. Mm, they're, so, yeah, all right, said an exasperation. Go F yourself, Lucia Williams. Therefore, we may not alter them. Accordingly, we find no error in the hearing officer's decision. Mm, incredible. It doesn't sound like they could possibly find an error because they just have to stamp through whatever she said. It is therefore ordered that the April 30, 2020 decision of the hearing officer that disqualification of the claimant from award of benefits pursuant to 873 um, engaged in rude, insolent, or offensive behavior is affirmed. Wow. I guess returning to work is insolence. Hmm. Now, so after that, there would be no explanation of what happened. So I'm seemingly now not entitled to unemployment benefits, but like if I hadn't worked... I could still go try and collect unemployment benefits. So, again, they're not going to offer me any explanation. They're not going to help me at all because they're trying to steal as much money as possible while just making patently false and absurd accusations after accusations like my arrival early at work is now an episode or an incident or whatever they want to call it. Like, not really. But I keep clicking the unemployment button, right? I just keep clicking it. Just curious what's going to happen. No money shows up. So I keep clicking that for about a month or so. No money shows up. Maybe it was even longer than that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so guess what? I quit clicking the button. I guess I can't collect unemployment anymore during the pandemic. And actually, I've been applying for jobs and stuff. It's incredibly difficult during this time for whatever reason because the companies are just firing everyone. And so here's what happens next. So I stopped clicking the button, and now they're going to claim, oh, look at all these overpayments. Like, again, they did not tell me I was going to be charged or anything. They did not notify me about this. The bills just start coming and keep on coming. So I go in there and I just keep clicking pay on these things. 900 bucks apparently was enough. And what was even more concerning is like I kept actually putting this amount in, right? $1,800. And then it would still say current balance due. So I'd be paying it and I'd still be seeing like I owe 1800 Very confusing. And I believe there's even another bill for $1,800 there. Um, but I can't seem to find that one. But anyway, so I just kept clicking pay on those things. I was basically too afraid to check my bank account as it just kept going down, 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 up until the last one in which I was calculating like, oh, I don't think I have enough money to actually afford this one. Um, and so at that point in time, I signed a little waiver. And fortunately, I'm not even sure I could have. But yeah, I didn't have to pay all of that back. I think they only charged me for the first 993 the um, hearing officer Williams fee there. Very, very quaint. I'm getting charged money during the pandemic uh, as I'm unemployed now and basically have no money in the bank. Very cute. So these are some emails I have. I'm going to go over this um, first time. This was a couple years after I started working there. And like finally, the management had pushed me to filing a complaint with OSHA. So I showed some of this stuff earlier. Um, this is just copy and paste into my complaint documents. But I'm just going to read through some of the emails I sent previous years and I'll let you uh, judge how absurd they are. So back in the day, again, the issue of sun glare would come up all the time. The job was about like 
percent outdoors or so. And a lot of that was dealing with cars and water and windows and snow glare. The owners had completely banned sunglasses. They were completely opposed to them to a psychotic degree, as you can imagine, working outside job with no sunglasses. And they would just say stuff like unprofessional, like every single police officer who's out there during the day is wearing um, sunglasses. Are, are they unprofessional? I don't know. So this email was sent back in 2018. Hello, this is Jacob Keeney from Lower Location. I just want to say overall, I enjoy working here, but some old and new issues have been bothering me. I believe the first step to resolving my concerns is coming to leadership and hearing your opinions. At nearly every monthly meeting, the topic of sun glare and sunglasses come up. I was once marked down for not making proper eye contact. I tried to explain that the sun glare on the windshields was too intense to look into. The manager said I needed to make eye contact under all circumstances. A bit stunned by the coaching I was receiving, I began asking if I should be staring directly into the sun glare in an effort to make eye contact, and was told yes. I asked them to put the coaching in writing. They declined, stating I could pull my hat down low. So they're saying absurd stuff. I would I would usually just ask for it. Are you willing to put that in writing? And like suddenly they would give me some weird answer. Like, oh yeah, just mm, cover your eyes with your hands or something. I don't know. Have to, okay, so pull my hat down low. I have to direct up to 70 cars in a half hour period, force me to look for long periods into potentially eye damaging conditions. The glare comes from beneath. The hat does not block the light or allow me to make eye contact. I've been told I can only wear UV glasses with clear lenses. Clear UV lens, clear UV glasses do little to reduce the intensity of the light. It will block UV, but if there's a very bright light, it's not going to block that. So you're still going to be burning your eyes out, even with most glasses. They're not actually rated to look into the sun or even the sun glare. Um, okay, reducing to light and have never been provided at the loading station. How can Breezer ask employees to make eye contact in terms of glare? while well, denying adequate eye protection. Well, actually, they would demand it and coach you You do it. My next concern is the lack of precautions taken when electrical storms pass over the car wash. The topic has been brought up more than a few times at safety meetings. Currently, the car wash stays open and an employee must load all vehicles. The loader is required to stand in a wide open 10 foot by 10 foot door next to a metal conveyor that bisects the entire tunnel extends up and extends outside. There's also a large waterlogged trench exposure size. This connects to an underground water system. The loader is standing up to heavy machinery, the sky, water pipes, as cars able to have someone loading cars next to recognized lightning hazards during a storm. As far back as you could go while loading in a lightning storm, there was also a huge, um, or sorry, just a metal pool that went all the way up to the ceiling that was basically now touching your back. So completely not safe. If that car wash was struck by lightning, the employee would probably definitely be getting destroyed. My last area of concern comes from last night's meeting. When an employee asked about getting the wash pass brochure translated into Spanish, the issue of language barriers came up. Some comments made by John, the owner, concerned me. At one point, he suggested we shouldn't try to sell wash passes to non-English-speaking people because they have bad credit and wouldn't make the monthly payments. The conversation made me uncomfortable. Non-English-speaking people seem to be prejudged and undesirable customers. I want to make sure no customers are being discriminated against. I would like someone to clarify what exactly was meant by those comments. I hope to hear feedback from you on these issues soon. Thanks. So they would email me back and request a dinner meeting. They would give me, of course, no written feedback at all on these issues, but I did record that conversation. So I'm just gonna scroll through uh, some of that real quick. It was actually very difficult to type up, but I have some that typed up. It's part of that meeting. I'm just going to go through some of this stuff. I'll just, I'll just scroll through here a little bit. Down. So then there was a follow-up meeting with Just Salisbury after that dinner meeting. He, um, he was supposed to be at this meeting. He couldn't quite make it. And they really spent a concerted effort trying to get me to quit because I brought up some safety concerns. And I wish I had that uh, audio recording, but I do not because I did not record it. And so I would go on to file an OSHA complaint about these issues, but they would actually do nothing. They wouldn't even take the recording. And uh, they sent an inspector to the site who did not even contact me. It was very, very weird. Classic investigation from the system. I initially called the retaliation person. Their only response to the concerns I was raising was like, oh, maybe we can make you an assistant manager. I was like, okay, yeah, no thanks. Thanks, Ocean. But I'd just like to point out some of these statements. So we're talking about sunglasses here. 
um, and this is John the owner, you know, you can find doctors that will support and say, oh, you should wear sunglasses. And we've also found people that say, no, you're not going to be damaged by looking in the sun. So, you know, and like this stuff was going on at like every monthly meeting for like two and a half years until finally I did this. And then they stopped showing up for a little while. That was about it. And actually, I wish I had more written because like after the sun and lightning topics, we then went on to the employee wash passes being translated where they made many, many racist statements. Okay, I'm just going to start this recording, and um, I'm going to try and play. I might even just play like a half hour of it. Maybe I'll upload the entire recording um, later, but I will just let you hear these this conversation. I'll, of course, interrupt a little bit like I always do. Again, this company had multiple groups of employees suggesting signing petitions about the behavior of the owners. I know, I know there's talk like an on food and then it's shaded glasses or however dark the estimate for this. This is starting about thirteen minutes into the recording. After all these things. I want to guarantee the owners. Yes, yeah, usually issue. Uh, the owners probably wear sunglasses. Like, I, I said, like, I've been coached before to stay off specifically with the sunglasses. In fact, I, I know for a fact that the owners wore sunglasses because the no sunglasses policy had kind of started, like, um, just a little while before I started working there. So the owners were wearing sunglasses the entire time they were loading cars. The, the customer's eyes are through the, through the window. So yeah, you don't have to look at the windshield, but you gotta make eye contact. Um, when customers are in a car, you actually gotta like look right on through that windshield, right on straight into the sun sometimes apparently. So he just said sunglasses. He said we'll find new employees before we let people wear sunglasses. Mm -hmm. I'd make the argument they can't see my eyes now because I'm not willing to look at the glare. 
And these people were completely insane. They would always associate, um, like, sunglasses with how poorly managed. Like, if they saw an employee with sunglasses, it's a poorly managed place. The recording just paused itself there, but you can just hear them like, or I hope, hopefully you can hear this recording because they just said like, um, let me see if I can just back that up just a little bit. Sorry to restart the recording here. So what happened the other day? You're wearing sunglasses will increase that taking care of When you make eye contact with somebody, they're, they're just naturally focused on you. When they wearing sunglasses, they can't see you. They're less inclined to focus on you. So, so wearing sunglasses will increase. So when working this job, the entire car could be like a glow in sun. And in fact, you were literally staring into the sunset as well. So for the entire last half of the day, the sun would be like setting directly behind the car sometimes. It was actually completely insane. Then had to look up and use mirrors to turn these back. The sun could literally be like directly behind these mirrors. And you actually had only like a few seconds to put in like a retract or else a customer's vehicle could be damaged. It's all quite serious stuff, and so you really did have to just be out there staring at glare. I would always just be out there with like my eyes closed, just like barely doing it, and I still felt like my eyes were being damaged. I finally wound up paying like three hundred dollars for a pair of like prescription glasses just to wear something. I'd say maybe, but I mean, wearing sunglasses, I, I'd be able to see better in my high glare. You could see better when you lose that eye contact. So I could see better. But I would lose that eye contact, and they wouldn't be getting eye contact. Yeah, they couldn't see me through the sunglasses. I just, I just wanted to bring it Invisible? Up. Sure. I wasn't going to let you know, like, people... It works babies. Like, ...scientists, right? It's just like, it's like, you know, like, getting their voices heard. So, sure. Yeah. I, would, I would certainly advise them something to say to myself around these. Like you said, we've tried it before. You know, the way back in the day, and we didn't end up kind of being... All day long, first thing in the morning. Oh, you know, it looks cloudy days. Yeah, cloudy days. It looks. I understand. Sure. You have some money yeah. still. So yeah, I think it's hard. Yeah. It's, 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 it's hard for somebody to understand that. You know, when you talk to the customer, we take it off, they still have them on, and they look on over. <laughs> if they're wearing them first thing in the morning, it's kind of, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And you definitely don't you know. Yeah. And we, you know, we've tried. We've been went down that route. Just and to play out. Even Ron mentioned he was wearing sunglasses. 
quit wearing them because the customers wouldn't pay attention to what was going on. So he, he felt that on his own of doing that, so he quit wearing them because of that. That's true. I've, I've never worn them, so I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't say for any answer. You know, the, um, you, know you, you can find doctors that will support it. They'll say, oh, you should wear it. But we've also found people that say, no, you're not going to be. So that was that original quote I read you. Um, found doctors that uh, support it, and then we found doctors that say you're not going to be damaged by looking into this. Um, every monthly meeting with this stuff, like this was happening to groups of employees, they'd be like trying to argue with the owners, you'd be getting these insane responses. The owners are completely delusional and incompetent and should probably be removed from any position of power. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if that's that's out of reason. Certainly, mm-hmm. when I first started working here, and I I never pushed back into it, so I couldn't say. The the fact that you need to really come to make eye contact with them as you're guiding them and while you're pointing at the sign, and that's the essence of that. The fact that you're blinding yourself, you need to look in that direction to have that glare. <laughs> so. To so a uh, perfect reflection of the signs on the windshield. Just don't look at that glare, but make eye contact with it. So I say I'm worried about being struck by lightning, so a bunch of other employees, and his opening statement is like, oh, I used to work for search and rescue, and some guy I was managing gets struck by lightning, and then the safety experts show up. So he knows the routine. He can get an employee struck by lightning, then the safety experts will show up and be like, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't be standing outside in lightning storms. So um, a lot of education from experts who run in people... Sorry, the air recording heat stuff, and it's restarting it. There was no door attacking. There was literally like a small, like two foot area where the employee could stand. It was right next to the building and right next to a. Middle bar going through soon. It's still there. I was just curious because I know the construction company is working. They see lightning off in the distance. You know, we pull all the guys out. You know, the, the qualifications for I understand is like if you're working at like you should be inside a significant structure. Or it's like that, uh, that open doorway. It's you know, an open doorway. With a, with a giant piece of metal that yeah. dissects the entire part. The metal is just like the ground. It's grounded. It's not going to the ginger oak. Yeah. You want to try that? 
So we'll be a risk. And I, as long as, as long as you guys are comfortable. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you're, you're more likely to get, get that car if that's work. Yeah, I like it. So, the same people telling you to stay uh, staring to the sun, think it's safe to work outside yeah, in the still. This is what I'm Safe place. And that's that's meaning like all safety standards prior to working on you know, like uh, Jimmy, suggestions what? I don't know. I don't know. I've always, I've always been curious about that. Like to me, I, I thought I saw a potential hazard to me. Just, you know, standing in a wide open doorway next to next to a heavy machine. You, the fact that your next to a small building is going to start the building. I mean, they could say the same thing about a, a crane. Construction site. No, it wouldn't start a crane yet. Yeah, it's a crane. Yeah, they, they can't keep their guns outside working. Because it's probably more likely to start a crane. Well, and lightning is very unpredictable force, so sure. assuming, assuming you know where it's going to strike. Well, yeah, Took about uh, like one or two minutes to shut down the car wash and put some cones out in front of it. I, I just wanted to bring it up, but I, I was never confident about it. Well, as long as you that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, there's a So I'm going to just continue on to where I did not write it down because that is where they begin discussing this wash pass and why they won't get it translated for Hispanic customers or not English speaking customers as they refer to them. And many employees tried to get this wash pass for sure translated. Like not, not just one person. Like I asked several times because yeah, a lot of customers actually uh, could benefit from it. I just kind of forgot that. Yeah, at the monthly meeting, like just an employee asked, like, oh, hey, can we get a wash press brochure translated? Probably would have taken someone about like 20 minutes to translate if that, because most of it was just like addresses and prices and stuff. But yeah, they're like, oh, they won't be able to, um, they have bad credit, won't be able to afford the monthly payments. And then Denise is like, yeah, well, even if they pay more for a one time wash, that's fine too. <laughs> I'm sure it is for them. Sorry, yeah, the recording keeps stopping working, so I'm restarting it. Absolutely. 
said, and the reason I thought you might want to address that specifically is because I was at that open meeting. I certainly heard that. I know other employees were. Now you, you said that, Um, so other employees did. And I certainly don't know everyone well enough to know how they would interpret that. But if customers started getting denied water passes for those reasons, I could certainly see that coming back. He was coaching employees not to sell wash passes non English speaking people because they specifically had bad credit. So if an employee was out there like, oh, I can't sell you a wash pass, you have bad credit. Crazy. No, we would never. I had an employee, and they come up trying to buy a wash pass, and the employee's like, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That is not what we That was the reason I was given. Yeah, yeah. That was. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I just, I just said it's certainly open for interpretation. And what, what made me uncomfortable about it is, you know, there are certainly people um, at that meeting, probably like non-English people, friends, family, or relatives, or whatever. Um, they might not feel comfortable uh, voicing their opinions in that instead of a large group of people. So my, my suggestion was, um, I think, is to not try and sell them. <laughs> we shouldn't try to sell wash pads. Any any specific reasons? Just because we can't communicate. Sure. Like wait, you um, there's a lot of reasons one we can't necessarily communicate the terms of petitions to yeah, that's, 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 the exact, that's the exact reason I'm expecting. Yeah, and, so, that was good. and what and what happens is of course they sign up and they don't realize that six months, eight months, a year down the road, they have somebody contact us and say, Why am I getting charged? We have to refund them back. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they uh, it's difficult trying if they do purchase it and they, and they want to cancel it, it's difficult to try to find them in the system. A lot of times like, we get all the wrong information, the contact forms, that sort of thing, and that makes it real difficult. Uh, you know, there's just a couple of reasons. I mean, the communication is, you know, your communication is the number one reason why businesses struggle in, in, in a lot of other aspects of the world and that sort of thing. And if, and if you can't clearly communicate what this is all about, that causes a lot of problems. So I, that's, that's, that's the way I think about what you say. Yeah, they, um, if they don't speak English, chances of them having a credit card yeah. are fairly low. Yeah. So if they don't speak English, chances of them having a credit card are very low. John Agnew. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not necessarily true. Not necessarily, but generally. It's, it's kind of generalizing. I mean, non English people, English speaking people make up the majority of the planet. Hmm. So. Well, they do it with their. Yeah. Tough to hear. He said, um, the ones showing up to Fort Collins, Colorado, they're showing up here, they, they probably don't have credit cards. One page from back, most of his addresses for translation. So, so right now, uh, like a person maybe maybe struggles with English, that comes in and tries to buy a wash pass. They try and say, oh no, I think maybe she's just getting on the wash, and so I don't know if I can get it to them. Their, their friend comes up and speaks English and says, like, oh, you know, my friend wants to buy a wash pass. And I just be like, we are, not, have credit no, we are not denying them to buy that. If they want a pass and they have someone that speaks English and they have everything, absolutely. So, it's it's going, going through the effort of translating our information to Spanish. 
That's where the Phone pass. You know, don't make the sales pitch yeah. to somebody that doesn't speak English. Yeah. Because trying to, cause trying to sell, someone, sell something to somebody that doesn't speak English is different. So my friend, yeah, don't try and sell them to this. Just try to assist them with purchasing your car. Now, if they want to buy a pass and can have somebody that can communicate, that's different. They got a handler. Two options at the wash, a wash pass or a uh, regular car wash. And one person works three basics. Right. So what do you think we're effectively, how many customers do you think we're? Uh, I mean, I'm, I guess, trying to put that on front. How many do you think we're actually reaching? Probably like 50 out of us. I'd say it's probably like 20. Really? Yeah. Well, I can say someday I'd like to get like, every car. And, like, sometimes you can get three lanes. Are you effectively That's pitching true. into effectively maybe yeah. so effectively? Do you have one person working three lanes? How many are you really reaching? Yeah. yeah. So so there's some that are missed. So my point is just don't try and you know, just those are the ones you don't Try and I just wanted to sound no, no caution about the language, the language that was used and like the yeah, yeah, and, yeah, it was, so it was and people right, certainly, you know, kind of were bringing up like the next couple of days that they, they had their own issues with it. So uh, I just thought, I just thought you might want to address it. Right. Like, right here. Yeah. Just get like, you know, probably not. So, but, yeah, when I said don't try and sell them, it's exactly it. Don't make an effort to, no, they, they, do they interest? Yeah. Okay. No, we only, of all the I think this is about right the end of our like safety topic discussions. We'll see. We're, we're lucky to sell to 10% of our customers. Oh, okay. Are you okay with that? Yeah, no, I like it. So, so imagine people that don't speak English. So if you have 10 people that come in that don't speak English. Oh, I know why. I got a range. Let me get a what, do you think, what percentage do you think you try to sell it? I'm not sure. Probably pretty low, yeah. Or, or they wouldn't know what they're buying. Yeah, unless they had a wash press translated for him. Yeah, because hand in the documentation. And then they call her. Are you all done with your salad? I'll be back with the rest. They just denied, they just denied charge. Take like a charge back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, and then we, we just, so if they've signed up, and they deny it, we don't get that money. And we pay fees for the charge. Yeah, so, so that becomes very costly for us. If you've sold somebody that they don't really want. So that's, that makes me uncomfortable. There you go. Well, that sounds a little better. That wasn't their attitude at the meeting. The attitude at the meeting was, uh, yeah, just sell them a higher price, well, one time wash, whatever. All right, sounds good. I'll check the one. And that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just refund it. He was in a room. Yeah. So, the point being, you know what, you're going to miss a bunch of, selling for a bunch of people. So just make that one that you're and by the time sell those customers are difficult too eating with when you're standing up there and you somebody pulls up this screen and you're like hey welcome to Brisu and you can tell right off the bat that they don't yeah it's hard to communicate and so very easy to communicate I usually just say like Netflix like Netflix oh okay no I do like that you know and then kind of point the screen and show the price yeah we have prices that are pretty yeah they'll they'll say the price of the wash, you know, from the system and that kind of stuff. Uh, but 
but, you know, I mean, that's... I don't, I don't know of anybody that really tries to actively communicate to somebody that you know, speaks a different language. To a path of You know, unless they... You use yeah. hand signals. Or if you want to point at the screen where the price is at, and it'd be crazy. goes on for some time, but it's basically just a normal conversation after a certain point, but I remember. I'm gonna call it there. The, the craziest stuff was actually in the beginning when he was talking about the sun glare. I'm like, oh yeah, you don't you don't have to look at the windshield, but you gotta make eye contact. Yeah, same thing. Um, yeah, the owners of this company were completely insane, especially the first half I worked there. Actually, after that meeting, um, and then after knocking fire with Justin, they just quit showing up to the monthly meetings for a while. And it was actually very very boring in uh, normal monthly safety meetings. So glad to make this video. I'll probably still be making more videos about Breeze Two Car Wash. Just for finding this information, I plan on writing a book about these people. I got plenty of more. Um, so there we go. Hey, thanks for watching this if you did, and uh, have a good day.